Uh, welcome to the planning board meeting for uh, Monday, August 22nd, 2016. Thank you, HCAM, for recording the meeting. And also, uh, thank you to the school superintendent for providing these very nice digs. Uh, the agenda today is we're going to start off with a LED streetlight uh, project discussion from the town engineer and the Green Committee. Uh, we will have a continued public hearing, which is the first actually portion to amend the master plan special permit for uh, Legacy Farms LLC. And uh, then the third thing is the continued public hearing at, uh, for the new elementary school. We're starting about 15 minutes late, so we'll kind of adjust schedules as we go. Uh, and whether we make up time or not, uh, we'll still intend to, to give the full two hours to the school today. Um, <coughs> Frank, uh, I want to publicly apologize that we actually took the vote last time. We, we had a hard time uh, saying no uh, after some pretty good presentations. And I know we had kind of said we'd kind of let it wait, but we had a lot of time and we ended up going ahead and doing it. Uh, another announcement I'd like to make is the Zoning Advisory Committee is looking for applicants. Uh, our next meeting, we're hoping to appoint them. Uh, I believe Elaine Lazarus is collecting all the uh, uh, expressions of interest to that. And maybe this year we might try to limit the number of members because we were finding the 14 or so that we appointed last time are a little bit ungainly. So not knowing how many people are appointing, we're thinking uh, maybe close to 11-ish. Uh, yeah, I'd like to thank uh, all the members for showing up uh, at the meeting today. <laughs> and we have everyone now that Fran is here. So, and who flew in special for the meeting, which is, which is great. That's right. And, uh, no, we, don't, we don't have Cliff. We don't no have Cliff. What? We no don't cliff. Have oh, no Cliff. Ah, hi, Cliff. <laughs> He'll be watching the tape, I'm sure. Okay. Uh, and then thank you to the members for, for, for uh, coming to a kind of uh, an extra meeting in August. Okay, so let's uh, start off with the LED uh, uh, streetlight project, project discussion. Dave, do you want to kind of talk oh, about it? Yes, th thanks for having us here today. Um, just wanted to give a real brief, so we could pick up some time for you uh, this summer. The, the project was approved at special town meeting last October. It's a like conversion of existing streetlights to LED lights, more of an energy saving measure. Uh, so the priority one, the um, sustainable green for that project was to replace uh, in kind with a comparative watch as kind of a phase one. But through the conversion and then address you know some changes once we implement them for additional feedback. There's an eight year payback currently on the project. Uh, $175,000 was approved at town meeting. Uh, as always, we're always looking for grants. Currently, there's a grant available um, for the town, so we are going to be looking for getting a grant on that um, to help pay for this. If we do get the grant, it's going to be more closer to a three-year payback for the project. So over the, you know, probably year and a half, we've been working, and I've been working with the Sustainable Green Committee uh, on this, a little more of the kind of lead on the project, um, and I've been assisting uh, with the procurement which went through a regional procurement process through MAPC with a few other communities. The selection of the lights originally was based on the vendor who was selected through that MAPC requirement, uh, requirement procurement. It was three lights that they selected. Uh, there was a local manufacturer um, that we also added in, so there was a fourth manufacturer we looked at. Uh, based on the vendor's recommendation, some you know other research and comparing a GE light was selected uh, it's made in America it's uh, it had a lot of advantages over you know some of the other fixtures um, plus the vendor has used that that fixture in other you know town-wide conversion projects we got to the point where you know we, we started selecting lights uh, sustainable green one put up a couple of fixtures for people to look at, uh, you know, in the field. So there was the three locations where we put, put up different types of lights, 
on Cedar Street and Main Street, uh, Chamberlain Street at Sanctuary Lane, and on Ash Street in front of the Center School. There's two different kinds of light. They, they call one a 4,000 and one a 3,000. Uh, know, up, only up until <coughs> five, six months ago, the American Medical Association that you can't come up with a, a recommendation for what type of LED light to use up to a maximum, I think it was a 3,000K color. Um, and we worked with the vendor, um, and they agreed to just switch over the, you know, the industry standard prior to the AMA article was a 4,000 color hue light. So this project is going to implement, the, you know, the stable means to implement that 3,000 light. Which, which location had the light you picked? Cedar Street and Ash Street. Um, we installed both types of lights there. Um, <coughs> one, one looked at one, more of a brighter light. Um, another one was more of a yellow or yeah, more colors. A little white, so the first, the, the first couple lights on Cedar Street are the, the brighter ones, the 4,000. And the next two are the three. The one in, directly in front of Center School uh, was a 4,000, and then the next two down uh, away from Main Street was a 3,000. Uh, on Chamberlain Street, it, only the 4,000 we were able to be put up. We weren't able to get, get a 3,000 light installed there. So, and those were the three locations. I think most of the feedback that, that we received is the 3,000 light was, was kind of a better, a less harsh light. I'm going to take a poll of us because we were expected to go out and look. <coughs> sure, sure. I mean, I so, was, so it, it, we, we found it, I found it, at Cedar Street there's so many competing lights, the, the light off the flagpole at the, from the post office, it was harder to tell on Cedar Street because of the other ambient light, but on Ash Street it was a lot easier. Right? That, that's what I found. I, I don't know what... Yeah, you, I would agree with that, right? The ones on Ash, you could really tell those first two were really bright, especially when you got right underneath them. I mean, it really hit you. But you guys picked the, the two down, down, down here. Yeah. So, of those who looked at the lights, did you like the ones they picked? <laughs> you know, just raise your hand, I guess. Yeah, yeah I thought they were fine. They were okay. Yeah. They right. were okay? Yeah, it's fine. I, I, I preferred those two to the ones over closer to center school. Yeah, that, I th the, the, the harsh 3,000 over the harsh 4,000 one. Yeah. yeah. So, again, the, the project update to the select, and they had asked us to go to a couple different boards and get some more feedback. So. Well, you get some feedback, but you've already made the decision. Well, well I mean, again, it's, if you don't know what you don't know, so you, you get feedback from a bunch of different um, boards who, who deal with, you know, site lighting. Well, that's, uh, that's one good thing for us having yeah. gone out to kind of. You know, we now know kind of the visual difference between the 4,000 and the 3,000. So, so, Mr. Chair, just yeah. to, I did not get a chance to personally go see them, but we, I did attend the uh, design review board last week, and most, just about everyone was in favor of the lesser, um, the 3,000 versus the 4,000. Indeed. Last week we went to design review board. Historical Commission was invited. Woodville Historic District folks were invited. Downtown Historic folks were invited to that meeting. And, you know, some of the feedback and suggestions, you know, shielding, a back shielding of the light. <coughs> it was, you know, something that sustainable green said, we'll, we'll buy the shielding. And then the initial was, let's put them up, and, and if we get feedback, we'll install the shielding. Based on that meeting, you know, some residents were there and asked, you know, my house is close to, close to the street. Can you just put it up initially? So, you know, that's a recommendation of sustainable green said, right? let's work with the vendor and, no, if a house is within 50 feet, maybe. Um, well, just automatically put up. If, if it was the planning shield. board's rules, you know, we would go t kind of to the to the parking lot, and that's where the cutoff is. And maybe you go 10 feet beyond into it. But, for example, the, the regular street light across the street from my house, and it's on the other side of Ash Street, <coughs> it shines in and it gets the, the transom from over my front door and the light shines exactly on the, bo the bottom step of my stairway, which is kind of a nice safety light <laughs> for me. But, but you know, it, I could see where that would be more irritating if it was not 
in that per particular location of the house. And, and that's just regular, you know. So I think shielding, personally, if, if it was a planning board standard, I think we would require shield or light the street and the sidewalk maybe a few feet into the property line, but, <coughs> but not so you're into somebody's house. And, and that, I mean, that's the intent. When you put the lights up, you know, they, they're going to, for all intents and purposes, purposes, be level with the street. They're going to be tilted. You have adjustments to tilt down left and right. Mr. Chair, just once again, in the, the previous meeting, there was a lot of discussion about the shielding, and it was noted that technically the lights are supposed to just act without the shielding because that's their job. I understand you're trying to, and, and that's what we're trying to do, address the concerns where the shielding was really needed because, um, you know, it's still using the same amount of electricity sure. by adding the shielding. You're not saving anything there. It's just a question of the lighting. Well, the other observation, having been sent out for a mission to look at street lights, I think you need to budget a few bucks for tree trimming because particularly <laughs> yes. the the light, I'll say, closest to Main Street on Ash Street was kind of basically hidden because it was installed in the middle of a tree. And, you know, that might not be the best pole to have that light on. The, the one in front of the schools immediately south might have been a better spot, but there are a lot more I noticed just in, because now I'm aware of street lights that, uh, you know, so somebody's got to bring a little saw along. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that, that was definitely, um, we, we addressed that with the vendor, and, you know, adding tree trimming where needed. Um, you know, and again, out of the other other board meetings that we had, um, we were going to go back and evaluate the design. The initial intent was to do, just replace lights where they are with a comparable wattage, but a lot of the feedback was that 53 watt light the one that's in front of Ash Street is just, might just be too bright. Um, we can, we're going to go back and maybe you know, reduce the number of these higher water lights and just go to that middle one as a, as a baseline. Mm -hmm. We're going to ask the vendor, you know, what, what that really does. Is it, is it a big deal or is it not a big deal? Well, we, we've kind of, as a, as a town-wise and philosophy of this board, is we've reduced parking lot wattage, you know, level, uh, you know, primarily just yeah. for, for more dark sky type thing. and. And, you know, Selectman Strazula started it a bunch of years ago just to save money when they literally took half the street lights out. And this board has not approved a new subdivision with street lights in it for 10, 15 years at least. So, I mean, the street lights are really just kind of on the older roads and, you know, it, we seem to get along okay. I mean, Right. It, was, it was kind of the third item that came out of the meeting last week is we possibly reduce the number of lights we, we do have. Um, yep. So all of those were kind of, you know, as called a phase two of the project. You know, once we get them up and converted, um, try to get some more feedback and maybe we can reduce the number of lights, put up the shielding where needed, um, maybe change some of the wattages of the lights. So, um, well, uh, Claire, do you have some comments? Yeah, I do. Um, Claire Wright, 20 and Dave now, and um, board selectman as well. A couple comments. Just a general comment on process. Um, I'm kind of sorry to see the way this process has developed because um, I would have wanted to see town feedback and some choices earlier on. Um, it seems that the choice was made on the fixture, and now we're just trying to do band aids to mitigate areas where it's too intense when. Um, there are a variety of LED lights out there, and some are more intrusive. Some have more glare than others, but this, you know, it seems like this is the this is the light, and we're sticking to it. So, I, I'm sorry about that process. Um, but there are some other factors besides just the 3,000 um, Kelvin is just the temperature, which indicates the color. But the lights to be seen, and there were Chamberlain Street lights as well that weren't indicated on the memo, um, there were wattages. I think the Cedar Street um, has a wattage, the number underneath it says 53, which is very, excuse me, the, um, the Ash Street one has the most intense wattage. It said 53 under it. The post office said 32, and the ones on Chamberlain said 15. Um, so that 
the intensity, the wattage of the light is another way we can manage um, the effect on the neighborhoods. And if you looked at the Chamberlain Street lights, they were a much softer, to me, uh, effect than the ones outside the center school. Um, I would hope that before we do this, we would kind of do a lighting plan and decide before rather than after where we need to put which lights because hot, the design review board meeting had 10 people, which is a lot of people. There's a lot of concern there about the impact on homes because Hopkinton, almost every street is residential. Um, and, you know, to try to then, we'll, we'll stick shields on afterwards. I mean, I think it's glad that we, I'm glad that we can put shields on, but instead of putting up this glaring light and then waiting for people to complain, um, I think we should really look at the town as a whole and decide what we want to put where and try to start out by doing it right instead of going back and trying to mitigate it after the fact. Um, you know, I think the side residential streets don't need a lot of light. I, I would encourage everyone to go look at the Chamberlain Street ones, which are a lot softer than what's at Center School. So I, I just think we shouldn't do a blanket solution and then try to go fix it afterwards. We should do a lighting plan with these lights. Go ahead, Frank. Um, well, first of all, we miss having you at our meetings, Claire. Thank you, guys. Um, your knowledge about light especially is very important. Um, Aubrey, you've uh, raised uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars for projects that saved the town millions of dollars. I, I thank you on the, for that. Um, but I think Dave is right. The plan has been in place and working been worked on for two years. It was two town meetings ago. And uh, Claire's concern about adding streetlights. Are we adding any streetlights, or is this what is there is being replaced? What, what the, the goal was Did I mishear that? No, I didn't say anything about adding. I, I, I said we should look at. Yeah, you know, the, the goal was to keep the streetlights where they are for this project. Because once you start adding streetlights and taking streetlights away, that's just gonna it's just gonna build in complaints for residents. Did you quit coming? And the design for the project, it, there's 560, 550 lights in town. Um, the current design, is about 50 of them are the bright lights, the 52 watt ones, it's about 10% of the lights. And those are by far the majority are on, on Main Street, East Main Street, West Main Street. Um, we have 138 of the 32 watt lights, which are the ones that are on <coughs> Cedar Street. And those are probably the you know, Cedar Street lights, Wood Street lights, <coughs> probably in those, and then the 15 watt lights, there's 350 of them, so it's probably 75 percent of the lights, and those are all the, the residential streets. So, I mean, you go down to the 15 watt lights in the residential areas, it's going to be, you know, I mean, that's the easiest way to kind of minimize the impact. But the, the charter was to basically replace the lights with the same amount of light. So we, we're not increasing the the, um, the wattage at all. Um, so whatever we have, whatever you see today is what you should see going forward. And there may be opportunities to, to change that, but that's not what we're charging. Right, and the feedback that we're getting from the boards at the previous meeting was, you know, maybe, maybe if it doesn't sound like anybody is in favor of some of these brighter lights, we'll just not have any 50 watt lights. Um, and we'll use some of the, the 35 watt lights just make sure from our vendor and their experience, you know, with street lighting is that's not going to create any kind of, you know, safety hazards or it's not going to, you know, create enough light in, in these areas. So. I, th I think you got to determine why that light, in, in a way, was put there. Is it was it a real safety issue or was it kind of a wayfinding or way back when a resident could request that the light be in front of their house for whatever reason. Yes. Sure. Claire? Oh, sorry. I, I just want to reiterate, in Hopkinton, every street is residential. Every street is residential. I mean, Hayden Road was a major street. It's residential. 135, Main Street, 
Cedar Street. Um, and, and so to try to separate out residential from non-residential, we need to find a lighting plan that is going to be acceptable throughout the town because except for maybe the West Main Street Commercial Center, there are residences everywhere. And, and there are not other fixtures to look at. There was one fixture presented to look at. Um, two different colors, a couple different watches, but only one fixture. So we're stuck with the one fixture. We need to do everything we can to make it the least intrusive to the residences. And at Design Review, that was the consistent theme, that there are residences on every major thoroughfare in this town, and we need to respect that and do the best we can. Well, I think maybe you can do much better with the cutoffs that these more modern look fixtures all have mm -hmm. and, and that might that might be the saving grace for uh, particularly if you, if you had a, a higher watt one next to somebody I think it's a great plan to save some money for the town and save some energy and, and you know but on the other hand these things last for forever so you don't want to <coughs> you don't want to replace them before the eight years because uh, you know the payback is kind of that long um, just a couple of comments. One is they wanted to keep this project very straightforward. It's already been two years, so imagine how long it's going to be if you, you try to get some feedback on which lights to lower, which ones to keep the same. So that was their, part of their plan is just to not make anything brighter, but just keep it the way it is. Um, another note that these gentlemen had brought up is they're not making anything brighter, right? So it can't be any worse than it is today. It's just... Um, and the, the third point is uh, we're kind of lucky with the timing on the two different colors because the standard just changed. So we'll be able to incorporate that, but there's many other towns out there that already have the, um, the non-standard ones right now. So, uh, I mean, my point is I understand the concerns of everybody, especially Claire and the town residents with this, the shielding, but I think kind of just need to get the, the project going. I would just point out a standard cobra is 2,500 Kelvin, and these are 3,000, so they are going up in, in color intensity. I thought the standard, Dave, from the the guidelines was 3,000. No, but a cobra is 2,500. The original LED lights that pretty, probably the, that are up everywhere, street light wise, were 4,000 K color lights. And the AMA came up with that recommendation this year, I think it was June, maybe. You know, street lights should, should stay under 3,000. Um, a couple of years ago, the street light manufacturers didn't have 3,000. So, so they're catching up as we speak with, with, with the standards. But it is a new industry, so uh, there's, there's changes to it all the time. Um, but again, the EMA rarely comes up with kind of direct kind of recommendations like that. We try to be a little more vague. Um, but they were pretty straightforward. Well, it sounds like it's about time to start implementing this. We're not the earliest adapters in, in, in the world, and you know, there's a bunch of other folks that are at it. So, yeah. one, Chairman, one more discussion, and then go. Yeah. go ahead. Yeah. I, I just uh, two points. What does it cost to change a, a single light, approximately? Well, two point math. <laughs> <laughs> there's about 560, 550 lights, and it's about a hundred after the rebates. Well, it's about one hundred seventy-five thousand dollars project, but we get. Utility company rebates about thirty thousand dollars. So it's going to cost the town one hundred forty thousand dollars. Five by five is three hundred. Give or take. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. So my question it leads into it's about, about three hundred. About three hundred. Give or take. Right. So my question leads into your phase two, where you're going to start to look at reducing the number of lights. I don't know if that was part of this, the scope of this particular project, but you made a comment that you know looking to over initially it was not, but you know based on some of the feedback from from the boards that we've heard from residents. There will be areas where there are clusters of lights that we can, you know, once you get to the well, you light up, you'll be able to see it's, you know, maybe three poles in a row and they all have lights and you can reduce the, the issue there is without the getting approval from everybody, you take it down, somebody might complain that they wanted that laid out for safety and they're going to put it back up and it's going to be twice as much work. So you yeah, need to do that analysis. When it gets to a smaller kind of, it's not a town line, it's a one-to-one you know, -one kind of basis, probably gather more feedback from folks in that, that direct area. I mean, if they can incorporate, I don't want to add scope creep, and I'll just my last comment. I don't want to add scope creep to the project necessarily, but if you can identify areas where you might be able to reduce a certain percentage of those, A, saving 300 bucks and you're not necessarily adding, making the switch, and then B, for those residents that, you know, having that light removed might be an okay thing. 
Right. So uh, you kind of alluded to it, but it might make sense to incorporate so it. Just it's one easier to add them back if you need <laughs> to. <laughs> and just one final real quick thing. One other thing that came out of the meeting is they're looking at putting these in in October, and they're looking at doing the downtown area first, and they're also looking at communicating on the website and everything and letting the town know that this is being done. Correct me if I misspoke there, Dave. No, no. Perfect. Okay, let's uh, segue to our next agenda item. For those that have just joined us, we're running a little bit late because of some technical problems early on, and we're in good shape now. So uh, Thank you. we'll good start with Thanks, guys. Uh, and Roy, as you're getting set up, let's uh, work on approving the minutes for July 11, 2016. Uh, there are a few typos in it, including Kobe's identified a bunch, I think, or a few. We're changing names and the names aren't one, and uh, we're going to change the identity regularly once extra. So, few uh, kind of other than typos, are there any other questions, comments, and minutes? Uh, Kobe does a great job on she these does. minutes, and, yeah. and we rarely find anything we have to change, but uh, if, uh, so. I'm looking for a motion to approve with the typos uh, corrected. So moved. Second. second. Moved and seconded. Further discussion? Seeing none, how do you vote? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Anyone abstain? Motion carries. Thank you. Okay, Roy, uh, we have a almost full board. We're missing uh, Cliff. Uh, everyone has been eligible, I believe, to vote at this point. So if he watches the tape, which we now have running, then Cliff will be able to vote on any continuation. So I assume you want to proceed. Uh, we do. Thank you very much. Do you mind if we give you a handout? Please. Uh, and then this is opening the, the continued public hearings, the application <coughs> to amend the Legacy Farms uh, Master Plan Special Permit. Uh, and this is a Thank proposal you. to increase the number of dwelling Thank units you. by 180 age-restricted uh, units. Thank you. Thank you. He's only in that one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, we have, uh, by the way, uh, we have an outline for this uh, particular hearing, and we will be following that. Uh, there's plenty of points for public discussion as part of the outline. Uh, and uh, I'm not expecting necessarily we're going to get to the end today, but uh, we will make a, a good 25-minute <coughs> type. Into, into it, and uh, there's a few items that I know we've been focusing on the research on, on some other things, uh, the schools, and so we didn't get to a few of these for, for this particular area. But first of all, we'll start with the applicant's presentation, which is a kind of a general overview, and, uh, and go ahead, Roy. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much. Um, you've received two things. You've received a package here. And separate and distinct from that, you received a copy of the zoning bylaw amendment that was passed at town meeting last year. So this has got very specific language. But what I'd like to do, if we could, if we could start with a book, and if we could open that up. The very beginning sections, it's broken down in four or five sections. The first section is actually just a rehash of what we submitted for town meeting last year. Can, can I make a comment for just a second? Yeah. We kind of have a policy to get these things in advance. We just put it together today. <laughs> again, this is just a walkthrough. This is this is right. really something you need this to study. Is, I guess this is his presentation, so we're expecting to, I guess, follow along page by page. It's really a refresher from last year. Right. I'm just worried about time, too. So. Yeah, yeah well, I'll move quickly. If I can. Uh, no, I take, take your time, because you, we haven't read it beforehand. So. OK, fine. Yeah. All right, the first page you'll notice is something we submitted last year. Uh, for the town meeting zoning bylaw change. It was a, basically, it was a handout. And if you look at the proposed change, it was proposing changing what we call the legacy park parcel from 200,000 square feet of commercial use to 
180 <coughs> units of age restricted housing, basically over 55 housing. And if you look slightly below the proposed change, you'll see what was approved in the past. It says approved project, and then adjacent to that, proposed change. So originally we had 35 larger single family homes as part of the north parcel, which could have been four or even five bedrooms. We proposed to take those out so that we would no longer have those, therefore reducing the number of potential school-aged children. We had 200,000 square feet of commercial space in that section, and we proposed, again, 180 age-restricted homes to include 18 affordable units, 10%, thus keeping our quantities of 10% in line. Again, 250,000 square feet of retail and commercial on the south side, that would stay a constant. Now we look at the benefits to the town in doing this. Uh, one of the benefits we proposed to the town was making payments to the town of $750,000 for a town-wide trail system and an additional $750,000 going towards putting the utilities in downtown Hopkinton underground. In addition to that, we proposed three payments of $120,000 each totaling $360,000 for public safety agencies, specifically the fire department. Now that's actually in the host community agreement, which is a document in here. Real quick question. That's future, these are future payments, nothing that has already occurred, correct? No, but one will occur this fall. Okay. Above and beyond that, when you look at the tax analysis, again, we have some documents here to back all this up, there'll be over a million, $1,500,000 in net positive tax revenue to Hopkinton compared to, as you can see in the right, compared to the $160,000 a year that would have been with a commercial development. This is annual. Matter of fact, if you look at the numbers, it's, it's projecting over $15 million over the next 10 years compared to probably $1,600,000 for the commercial use. So again, tremendous positive tax revenue, significantly more than the commercial purposes, and of course additional money is paid for uh, fire safety and uh, trails and downtown improvements. On the next page, again, please stop me where you'd like if you have questions. On the next page, <coughs> again, you'll see back up here from BHB, we'd have 74% less traffic. You'll see the traffic studies on the right, and the reason being for that, because we're eliminating 200,000 square feet of commercial uses, the biggest change would be in peak hour traffic, 7 to 9 and 3 to 5 in the evening. So by doing this change, we also reduce traffic in that location of Wilson Street, Legacy Farms Road, and what is now Rafferty going out to Cedar Street. We'd have fewer school-aged children because we'd be reducing, eliminating 35 larger homes on the north side and replacing them with uh, condominiums. 500 acres of open space, that's always been a constant, so that does not change. We've got a little definition here of what active adult is. It's basically one member of a family living in a home with one of the members being over 55 years in age. I won't go through all the questions in the next two pages, but I think it's helpful. You know, people have questions on what, it, what is an affordable unit, what if someone has a child, can they have a child, what would be what would the implications be if there were a child, that type of thing in the units. Talks about traffic. Uh, it goes into the issues of um, life safety personnel. So I, th I think we don't need to go through all the questions, but I think those are important things to keep in mind. When you go to the next section, if you flip your book sideways, you'll see again, it's sort of a reiteration of what we spoke of earlier, the current zoning at the time before this passed it down into proposed zoning. So you can see less larger units, uh, less traffic, retail commercial staying the same. On the next page, under the current zoning, again, before town meeting, this is a list of all the things one could do under that zoning. And you can see it was conference centers under special permits, business, professional office, commercial mixed uses, light manufacturing, research, adult daycare, assisted living, group homes, nursing homes, health clubs, hotels, motels by special permit, medical centers, medical office. So there's quite a few 
potential uses. On the next page, where it talks about proposed zoning, which is again the past town meeting, this again goes into some details, 180 units, 10% of which would be affordable, one occupant has to be over 55 years of age, it's, re it's restricted so children can't live here. Now what that means is, if, if, if you're a family who happens to have a grandchild who wants to spend a few weeks with you, or even spend a summer with you, they can do that. They just can't permanently live there, and they can't use the school system, so that's important. You'll notice that we've uh, baked into the uh, post community agreement. It says the homeowners association must pay $9,000 for a child using the school system. Now that is very, I'll call it sort of stern and unique in that most communities don't have something like that. It makes it, you're not allowed to do it, but it doesn't usually have a penalty baked in. So basically what you're going to have is you're going to have a homeowners association who's going to be protecting that rule as much as anybody else because it's going to fall under the burden of the homeowners association for that issue. Again, next page, again, sort of summarizing some of the benefits. A million eight hundred sixty thousand is part of the cash payments to the town, a million five in net positive revenue to the town each year, fewer school-aged children because there'll be no four and five bedroom units, over 70% less traffic because we're eliminating the commercial use. This at the time when it went to town meeting was supported by the planning board, the board of selectmen, ZAC, Chamber of Commerce, and the Upper Charles Trail Committee. Again, on the next page, this again just reiterates everything that was discussed earlier. We have back with information. Sorry, right here, Chair. Just, you didn't mention the 19 acre parcel. Is that? We have done to that page. I'm uh, sorry. That, that's already in motion. I'm sorry, am I ahead? I'm oh, sorry. As a matter of fact, we, we probably over the next week will be needing the town the okay. 19 acre parcel and the Apple Field parcel. There's actually two parcels. Sorry, I didn't mean to skip ahead. Uh, no problem. So again, this traffic, and we've got backup information from DHP and Judy Barrett from a lot of these things in the book. Yeah, we've vetted most of the information that's in here before I went to town meeting. Yes, we did. Roy, one question on the, uh, the net revenue for 1.5 million. Yes. In annual, is that year one out of the gate or is there a ramp? Well, no, I should say this. It's year one when it's fully built. Okay. Yeah, but obviously have to wrap up at 10 years sold. Right. But so you're thinking 2019? Um, I would say that's probably about right. Yeah. So again, you look at this next page, again, just sort of reiterates the benefits. The next section, if you turn the book around again, this is the fifth amendment to the host community agreement. And actually, if you flip to page two, this talks into the analysis that was actually done by Judy Barrett. You'll see the single, the senior housing development units are projected at 455,000 a unit. I frankly think in today's environment that's low, but let's be conservative. So you can see the tax revenue generated by that would be $5,800 a year. But if you look at the affordable units, the those are projected sales price of 180,000 unit, and those are bringing 800 dollars a year. So what this works out to be is when you take these numbers times 180 units, back out certain operating costs to the town, that gets you to your net 1,500,000. And again, that was corroborated with the planning board and with Judy Barrett, who is, Judy Barrett, by the way, is the town's fiscal consultant. And this goes into more detail. If you look in section three, section 85, this goes into the detail about the number of units, the number of bedrooms, the age restriction on the age of someone to live in that. So when you get some time, you can read that whole section. But that pretty much protects I think, them. I think members got that in the packet, so they probably have read this one pretty carefully. Okay. And again, it goes on to the next page. It talks about the guidelines, design guidelines, which we obviously have to go to the design review committee. Uh, down below, we're talking about the affordable units. Uh, there has to be one affordable unit for every 10 units, so that would still be. When, once we came back to any of the site plan review, uh, we would designate on that plan, working in conjunction with the planning board, where those 18 units would be, and those would be built and sold in phases as we went through the project. Again, if you go to the, uh, page four, 
This spells out in more detail what we just spoke about, about the three payments of $120,000 each paid to the town for public safety agencies. It was the understanding at the time that hopefully it would go towards the fire department, although I'm not sure it's totally spelled out here. I believe the, the question was, is this will probably drive up our ambulance usage in, in the town because of the, the age of the folks that are, yeah. you know, the old people like me. You know, it's funny you say that because it's deceiving because at the age 55, there's something qualified here. And if you think it's 55, I think they're that much different. Yeah. I guess he maybe just said that about uh, the senior living down the street. On the next page, it, it spells out the guidelines for the time the timelines for the payments. And that's really even that document. I think when you get a moment, look at it, because I think it spells out very clearly what the restrictions are, what the guidelines are, what the controls are the community relative to the age restricted. The next document you have here is a letter from the Brian, Brian, just a quick question. Going back to page five, I think it's just back one page. So it says, the first bullet point says, the earlier of November 15, 2018, or the date of issuance of a certificate of occupancy for the 180th dwelling. Um, my, I guess my question is, what if that date is before the first, uh, uh, what if this is before the first or 90th CFO? Talking about all the different payments. I think that was put in at the time because they were concerned that instead of uh, uh, paying the, that last payment, that somebody would only build 179. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe Ken's right. I think you're right, Ken. So the, I think that's the answer to the question. And then just underneath that, the next bullet under C. By June 30th, 2016, I'm assuming that has we not were actually been paid. Extended, we worked with the selectmen to extend that until the end of October. Okay. Thank you. Partly because the road is taking a little bit longer to right. build. <coughs> uh, the next document you'll see is a letter here from VHB. Um, they did an analysis on the age restricted versus the 200,000 square feet of commercial and also corroboration on the traffic. Uh, next you have, and this goes back to ways, this is actually a couple of years old, but it sort of confirms most of what we talked about. And this, this actually was done for the town, so this is not our document, this was a house document. This is again from Judy Barrett. Again, a little more corroboration on the rise of the red floors and age restricted versus commercial. I think these last couple documents ought to be required meeting for the continuance of the next next hearing because there's a lot of good stuff in the stuff. Can I ask one question? Yeah, go ahead, Chair. How many children do you expect to be added to the school system as a result of this addition? This? Zero. Zero. Even with the with the single family homes and the no no, no. you're we, saying we this. eliminated the single family. Okay, homes. I'm sorry. So the, just for this, you're saying none. Zero. Let's put it this way: if there's if there's one school child, uh, it's four. a hmm? technically it says it. Well, whatever it is, but I'm saying is if there's oh, I forget what the exact language is, yeah. but if if it goes beyond what's allowed here, it's a violation of the agreement for the homeowners association. And the homeowners association. And the reason it was designed to be the homeowner association and not the particular homeowner, yeah. the particular homeowner might just never pay it. But the homeowner association, when it becomes responsible, they can then lien that person's property to get payment from them. But it also, it all of a sudden now you have another 179 homeowners concerned about the issue. So it's, it's sort of checks and balances for the town. Thank you. But there was some discussion about that and our superintendent's here, she might be able to corroborate some of the details. Uh, but any child living in town has a right to an education, and uh, it's, it's, I don't think it's legal to charge for that education. So whatever the agreement is, it can, I don't think it can stand. Well, actually, our lawyers looked at it. You're actually, you're not denying the child an education. 
be denying them the right to live in that unit because you know whether they live somewhere else in town great and by the way if you're not charging them for education you're charging a fee to the homeowner association it's it's, it's it is legal we, we've looked into that next in the packet we gave you is again this is to be construed as very conceptual but this is a conceptual layout of uh, potential 188 units you'll notice the red building is actually a clubhouse with terraces and possibly a pool to be determined um, you'll also notice the the radius line to the left that is a sort of you know, across the line line very close Say, well, we're outside of it. But just, just for everybody's benefit, that's the LNG mitigation line. Yes. Are you talking about the semicircle line? Yes. Okay. Yes. The LNG mitigation line, right? Yes. Okay. Now, I will say, uh, our consultant, uh, we felt, and he told us he was being very conservative. This line was actually roughly 1,180 feet. The original line of the Air Force people had was 1,000 feet, so it was probably 180 feet closer. Our fellow said, look, I, I feel safer if there's going to be another 180 feet. So we went with a more conservative version. So again, you'll see this, this two, one contiguous parcel the two separate components. I believe one has about 50 units, the other has about 130. Again, this is very conceptual. I know you wanted to see something. If, if I could count the roofs, would I come up with 180? We knew you were going to do that. Yeah. <laughs> I know that. I, I will tell you, the, the engineers, when they first laid it out, laid out 180. 82. I said, do not do that. <laughs> I said, because Ken Weissman will count them and tell us we're off. So I, I think we're correct, but I, 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 when you get a moment, you can count them. So basically, you, you've got the package, you've got the uh, conceptual plan. The other document, when you have a moment, you should read is the amendment to the open space, the Osmo, if you will. And under number six, it goes into the detail of other units, the number of affordable units. And on the next page, it goes into the affordable and that type of thing. So between the host community agreement, between the Osmond that was voted at the time meeting, and various other documents you have in there, I think this covers pretty much everything I think you would need. I have a question. Go ahead. Yep, sure. I know we're just talking. When you came to us and presented this to us <coughs> a few years back, you started out with, I think, 240 units? Yes. And then cut it down to 220? <coughs> and, 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 and it got down to 200. And you were saying really you couldn't work at anything less than 200. Right. And at that time you were talking about uh, the clubhouse and a pool and other amenities for the, for the um, community. When, when we were talking to you back then, well, a couple things. One reason we brought it down is because, especially now, because we've changed the, the, the spatial space. When we were looking at doing 240 units, we were considering doing what's called a Dell Web. And a Dell Web is a, and Ken's very familiar with Dell Web. Dell Web is a, actually a company owned by Pulte that does a lot of high-end, uh, age-restricted or active adult, if you will, communities around the country. Most of them are 500, 1,000, 1,500 units, they're quite large. They do have one down at Pine Hills in Massachusetts. I believe that's the only one in Massachusetts. They were considering doing one here. They ideally would like to do 240 to do one. They would do it one on 180, but that was actually the break line for them because it's because of the amenities they like to do. They like to have enough critical mass. So that's the reason why we're trying to get a larger because it just would have been that much more in the amenities. So I mean, do we do we think that there's still going to be some of those amenities? Oh, definitely. I mean, obviously the if you had 240, there'd be more amenities for 240 than 180. I can tell you that there are four or five projects going on in the area right now. As a matter of fact, Pulte's doing one right now in Holliston <coughs> that we went to visit the other day at 66 units. It's not a Del Webb, but it is age restricted. Uh, they've got about 35% 35, 35 of the projects sold out. And 10% affordable. And 10% affordable, they've had multiple three and four offers for each affordable unit. So they have no concerns about the affordable whatsoever, and it's an age restricted. Well, I, I, Mark had provided, I think, the board a list of some where these affordable ones are. Can you kind of maybe expand on that with some contact information and people that we could, you know, 
go go view it sure. and, and, and you know take a look at it yeah I'd recommend you also go look at Holliston Woods <clears throat> it's in Holliston and if you want I could set up a tour for you with someone from Holty okay uh, and I think there might be one up in Acton or not there's another one in Acton yeah and and then maybe if are, are you dealing exclusively with Pulte at this no, point? No, we actually have three parties that are interested in the property. But um, what's the old expression? You're going to have more than one horse to have a race? Yep. <laughs> I think you know that's part of it. But I think the other side of it is we'd like to see who's got the best ideas. Well, if you've got maybe a couple of spots for us to go look at where they built a similar type of thing, you sure. know, the other two guys, we'd be happy mm -hmm. to go look at those too. We will arrange that. One of, one of the things that you might notice that kind of with this, that the design guidelines, it was supposed to be similar to what's in the town, but different than what's next to it. Mm -hmm. So We have a project that we're involved with also we can bring you to. It's called uh, Montage and Framingham. 173 units. And, and your concept is, is all duplexes, basically. Yep. It, the way I kind of read the word, it had to be multi-family stuffs. <coughs> when, when we were talking about that, was simplexes really allowed? I'm not sure you could have fins. Yeah, simplexes simplex are actually, actually are allowed under multi-family under the SPA special mm -hmm. permit. Okay. But spatially, we felt, felt this fit better. Is, is any particular day, a time of the day, a day of the week better? Committee. Well, maybe depending on where it is, you know, maybe we'll just get it, you know, kind of do a field trip. Would, would a Saturday be better or would you like to do it during the week? Well, that's where we did the walkthrough with you yeah, before uh, Legacy uh, North was a Saturday, Saturday morning. morning. Yeah, I think probably Saturday. <laughs> would this Saturday well, be okay? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> with the governor on Saturday. Is this something that can wait till after Labor Day? Because people free up after yeah. Labor Day. Early in September. When's our next meeting? September 12th. September 12th. So we maybe... September 10th. I haven't, I haven't looked at September Saturdays, but maybe we can get it right in that area. Ken, if I can ask a question. Yeah, go ahead. I, I, you're very restrictive on how you allow children into the development. How do you legislate the affordable housing? After the first sale, how do you continue to keep that as affordable? Well, let's put it this way. First off, it's, it's not us that's doing it. Um, I know it's been a requirement of the town. The town negotiated that the fee thing wasn't, uh, we didn't offer it. You know, town council and others wanted to make sure there was a, a, a quote unquote penalty. How do you keep the No, no, I'm going to get to that. And as far as the affordable piece, it's actually on your deed. So when you buy the unit, on your deed, recorded the registry of deed, is the restriction, and, and by the way, all the guidelines will be there for the affordability, uh, of the unit, will be condo docks, et cetera. So when you go to sell that unit, it has to be, the good news is you get a great deal when you buy it. The not so great news is when you sell it, it's gonna be a great deal for the next guy. So, it constantly stays in the pool of affordable in perpetuity because it's a permanent deed restriction. So there's a percentage that they have to hold to? I mean, you can't res restrict them from ever making any money on it, It's based you? on 80% of median income. There's no. a whole formula that the state does. It goes up very small increments a year. As far as value of the property? Yes. So you might buy it for 180, and let's say you sell it, I'll pick a timeline, four years from now. You know, depending on what happens, you might be able to sell it for 190. 185, 195, depending on what the market does and CDI and all that kind of thing. Right. And there's no term limit on that. Or if they keep it for 15 years, that it's no longer valid. It's permanent. It's, it's permanent. Yeah. Maybe maybe Jennifer could get some information to the board members as to how that kind of works. It, it's really counterintuitive to all the market and everything else, and it's amazing that it works at all. But it seems to work a little bit. But they do it across the state for every affordable project. Well, see, it would, it would be unfair if, if someone was able to buy the unit and all of a sudden had a score and sell it for 500. That would totally defeat the program. So affordable buyers technically don't earn equity in their homes. Right. They can just 
make a little bit back based on inflation. It's they've deed riders attached to their property, and like they said, the state sets resale values. We have nothing to do with it. They have nothing to do with it. It's set by the Department of Housing and Community Development based on area medium income. So they don't. There's no equity earned in an affordable unit at all. Well, when you pay off your mortgage, that's equity. Yeah, but it's only whatever you bought it for. It's not like like you don't get any additional. Even if you do improvements to it, you don't get that back. Okay, I think we're at a. We, we've got yeah. through the first presentation. I think board members have got a lot of information that we will use in the general discussion. And we'll, we'll kind of check off the first box and we'll start again with Jennifer uh, on, on her report uh, and, and maybe expand upon it with a little bit of how that looks uh, at, at the next uh, meeting. Uh, what time? Uh, so right now we have um, a scenic road hearing at 7.30 um, and we still have a minor um, amendment to a uh, site plan that we haven't scheduled yet but was going to schedule on that for a okay, golden pond. Okay, so that one's going, let's, let's try it at uh, 8.30, huh? 8.30. So eight, the motion is to, to continue the public hearing to 8.30 on September the 12th. So moved. Moved. Second. Second for the discussion. Discussion about the site walk could perhaps be September 10th. Is, that, is it too early to talk about that? or that, That's 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 okay. Let's, let's, that is isn't Labor Day weekend? Oh. No. The no, after. No, so Saturday after. 10th of September, if we can, maybe? Plan on it. Uh, Somewhere close, maybe. Austin. May, maybe we meet at Town Hall and carpool. I mean, you know, we're very environmental conscious tonight. Seven a.m. We get a little bus for yeah, party bus. people. <laughs> party, 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 party bus. <laughs> Go to Cooperstown. You want us to arrange a bus and we can hit Acton and Alston? Oh. I think we'll take care of the transportation. Yeah, because it might. Some people might be able to make one versus the other. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, we, we need to vote on that yet because we Sorry, haven't done so that. All those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Anyone abstain? Motion carries. Okay. For those folks at the school, we ended up for technical problems starting about 15 minutes late. And the school is usually pretty nice. They don't throw us out at 10, so we're still planning on two hours. Uh, so you don't feel like you're getting cheated out of your couple of moments here. Appreciate that. Okay. Let's, uh, let me get all my paperwork sorted out here for a second, and then we will reopen the uh, continued public hearing for 129 Hayden Row Street. This is the new elementary school building site. Uh, Site plan review for the town of Hopkinton. We've got a lot of stuff to go through tonight, so hopefully uh, people will keep their questions short and to the point. However, this is part of the public hearing process, so that the public is encouraged to ask questions and. Um, we will be continuing to go through the outline uh, that we've established for this. Uh, maybe we start off with you guys giving a summary of kind of what's changed between today and the last time we met. Sure. Uh, thank you, Rick. Uh, Jeff Domingo from Compass Project Management. Uh, so since we last met, uh, we made, made another major submission to your board. So we've updated all of our drawings based on the comments collected of this committee as well as through your peer review uh, engineer data. Uh, those drawings were submitted to the board last Tuesday, and I believe you all have a copy in your packet. It might be a smaller size scale, hard to read. If it's bigger sizes on the table, if you need it. Um, through that time, we walked through the uh, traffic updates, civil updates, uh, utility updates. Those have all been reflected in the drawings in compliance with what data has reviewed and commented on. You'll note from Beta's most recent draft memo, which I don't know if we got one today or Friday or today. today. 
um, that I'd say 99% of the items are closed out. A couple of ones that are remaining open are traffic. Those, the majority of those comments were sent to us at, at the same deadline on Tuesday when we were getting our material to you. We've since had a discussion on uh, this morning or this afternoon about those remaining open items. They were consisted of signage, whether posts on the vertical post or horizontal paint on the street. And um, we've had some discussions on those, and I think we're near completion on the final comments there. So with that, um, we have uh, are continuing our presentation. So we've gone through everything pretty much on your first page of your agenda. You'll notice checked off yellow uh, and has been completed. Uh, we left off at the building design. I'll uh, remind this committee that I did juggle a few things out of order when they made sense. So a few of the items that are coming up after this, we've already uh, closed in our view in terms of our discussion of the past three meetings. Um, but we can uh, remind you or talk about it if there's an issue with there's, that. There's a couple items that I think are were kind of action items, so we didn't fully close them out. One was the buffers for the neighbors and also the, the lighting is partially done. Yeah, still the open. buffers was also on your later on your agenda on yep. K, but yes, it's yep. also still open up. It's all okay, so let's start with uh, so uh, building design. Um, so we have a presentation on uh, building design. I'm going to turn it over to uh, Jim to talk. Sure. And, uh, we'll continue on. Thanks, Jeff. Um, in terms of uh, this category of building design, there were basically uh, three areas of focus. Uh, one had to do with uh, lead, so high performance design characteristics of the building. Another had to do with the RTUs, the rooftop units, uh, noise generation, and levels of <clears throat> expectation uh, for the design. And then lastly, uh, footprint uh, area for expansion. So. Uh, the first one that I'd like to touch on has to do with the uh, site plan, or, or excuse me, the HVAC acoustics. Um, this image is of the roofscape. It shows you the several RTUs that are located up there. What we'd like to do is uh, focus on the, uh, the leftmost of uh, the RTUs. It is the one that ultimately is closest to Hayden Road. Uh, so as we look at it in site plan, there is that RTU in that leftmost position. This radius that I show simply shows what diameter distance that is that actually meets out to Hayden Road. And it's about 515 feet of setback. Uh, that's part of this site. Uh, we work with our uh, acoustician in terms of understanding the RTUs that are specified. Now, as you all know, this is a publicly bid job, so the actual RTU that will ultimately come may be different uh, because of open bid laws. We have to be able to specify multiple units that can meet the same thresholds of uh, performance. Uh, but we're using the basis of design as our understanding for the decibels, and the others as we understand it shouldn't shift radically from this position. Uh, our acquisition tells us that at that point of 515 feet, and actually, if it comes out to the throat where the, where the actual opening is of the site to the roadway, at that point it's about, about 715 feet, so another couple hundred square, or linear feet there. Um, our acoustical designer tells us that the expectation would be between 30 and 40 decibels. Uh, his take on it in terms of understanding of what might you compare that to, a uh, quiet suburban neighborhood, light traffic noise, uh, nature, so nature noises, etc. So that was his sharing of understanding of what that would be equated to in terms of sound level. Uh, I was able to pull up uh, a chart which gives an understanding of some other comparisons. So uh, the second line down, and I'm not sure you can read it from your dimension or your seating position there, but the second line down is whisper quiet library at six feet. And that's at about 30 decibels to give you an understanding of comparative. Uh, as we move down one more row there, 
normal conversation at three feet is about 60 to 65 decibels. So that was what he was able to share with us to help us understand uh, what we might expect in terms of noise generation from the rooftop units within this project. And just a point of clarification, will those units be running continuously or is there a time window that they're going to run on a daily basis? Uh, they certainly will not run continuously. Uh, these are all high efficiency units. Uh, they ramp up, so in other words, they're not, not at running at full capacity at all times. They're not running when not needed. Um, so there is a variation in terms, but what we're taking here is basically full bore on the unit. Just a quick question, that 30 to 40 decibels, that's per unit? Uh, we took it at the heaviest of the units uh, and utilized that. Uh, actually, the one that is positioned uh, as it's shown there in the westmost location, it's much smaller than that. That would be under 30 decibels. But theoretically, how are there five of them, you say? How many units are there total? I think there are seven. There's seven. Seven total. Could, in theory, all run at the same time, depending on the weather conditions? Could, in theory, run at all times. Sure. The decibel obviously would increase based on the amount of units running, you would say, at the same time? Uh, he did not offer uh, that as a, a comment, so I, I don't know. Um, you didn't ask me We proposed the information, we shared with him the comments, and he forwarded this information for us to share with you. I have a couple of questions. One is noise spec, one of your parameters that the, the guy, the multiple people are going to bid to, is that listed as something that meets so many dBs, or is that just left or wide open? It's typically not specifically identified. There are other performance characteristics that we would typically identify within the unit um, that would be more commonly used for performance criteria. <coughs> So, so basically, a guy that, that wants to cheap out on the bid and doesn't put any insulation into it is probably the guy that wins. I'm not sure that necessarily the insulated value of the unit is the driving force in terms of overall cost of the unit. But you know, certainly we have to be able to uh, review it, understand that it's meeting the criterion that we set. Well, uh, if, if the criteria had a noise criteria to it, then. I feel a lot more comfortable that you make it. I mean, I used to do equipment. I used to do a lot of cooling type equipment in, in my career. And, you know, it, it varies a, an awful lot depending on what you get and what, what you're at. I mean, and also, I don't look at it necessarily. If you, if you can take the white, the white part off of that page for a second, go back a couple of slides. <laughs> I am uh, okay. working with new equipment this okay. evening, so well, I'm we'll not certain I'm very okay. flexible. I'm sorry about okay. that. Try page up. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, if I could, while they're doing that, yeah. ask there, uh, a question. Okay, go ahead. Uh, the, what, what is driving the concern around the 30 decibels, given that this is on Hayden Row, where traffic is much louder than 30. I, you, you, great, se great segment. Yep. Okay. I look at those light green ones that are unbuilt, and those are somebody's houses, particularly the, the two right next to the loop road. The, the one next to the Irvine property won't be built. <coughs> but basically, if I go back to the, to the slide before that, and I can remember it, there's a couple of units over that area. And I don't think we're dealing at 500 feet from the house. We're looking at directly across the parking lot into about 50 foot of a person's backyard. So you're the parking lot plus about 50 couple feet. Couple hundred feet, I'd suggest. Yeah, a couple hundred 50, feet. Yeah. So, huh. you know, my question would then be to this person that is that close, you know, are we respecting them from a noise standpoint? I mean, the house isn't built there. But that is approved subdivision lot, uh, and you know. Mr. Mr. Chairman, I have a question. Uh, do you have standards from other uh, recent town projects to, as guidance, or a standard board typically uses for 
school buildings or uh, town we, projects? We, we insisted upon two noise specs for standby generators on recent projects that I can easily remember. Uh, both the telephone exchange, when they did that, were, were, the, were required to uh, put uh, acoustic panels around the equipment to protect the neighbors. Now, they were very close to the neighbors at that particular point. Is that the Verizon building? The, the Verizon Road, building yeah. on Hayden Row. And then the other uh, one was the DPW uh, generator. generator, which, which we required them to put noise specs into the equipment itself as a spec. Would it follow? What, what, what are the decibel levels? That, that I would have to try to remember. 30 but seems fairly low. It, it, it was a, a high point. 30 is a high point. If I could speak to Joe's point, um, I'm looking at typical sounds from that similar kind of grid that they were showing. Uh, a busy street is 60 decibels and it, it ebbs and flows. Uh, and. Uh, an average whisper is 20, so that's kind of a wide range between 20 and 60, but if uh, the sound of the air conditioning units are in the middle of that... Uh, it's a logarithmic scale. It, 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 it's exponential. It's not linear. So as a result, the difference between 20 and 60 is not simply 30 units. Excellent. Every 10 doubles. So it's not half. It's Correct. exponential, so it's closer to the lower end of the scale. Correct. These units aren't running in the middle of the night. Oh, yes, they are. Sure. Sure. You've got to keep the building be. from freezing. The buildings will be tempered, but when they're, they go into unoccupied mode, so in the evenings when there's no one in there, the town's not spending money for the heating and cooling a building. There's a ramp up that happens at you know, 6.30 or, or an hour, usually before school starts. The school's a little later into the high school, but it ramps up an hour before all the occupants get in there, so when they get in, the building is up to temperature, whether it's cool or down to temperature, whether it's heat, to make sure it's comfortable when people arrive. But it's not running literally with the windows open all, all night. So that you're wasting your money. All these uh, new systems and new buildings are on what's called a building information management system, so the BMS, and that manages. It dials down to individual rooms with sensors, and it has an overarching override that happens in occupied and unoccupied mode. But it could. So it's really during the daytime that we're talking about. But it could. It will be running periodically overnight. Correct. Yeah, I mean it's, it's uh, whatever the call is for right. whatever you need. I mean it's right on the coldest of nights the heat will kick on a little more. Just think about your home air conditioner or home heating unit. Same thing, right? I mean, the, the same principle. From this use, it's more of the heat because you know the, this is a the summer schedule is not heavy like it is in the winter. True. I would suggest we look at a couple action items. One is what, whether or not a specification could be developed to, to, to be on that. Second of all is maybe to look at where you might be DB level to 200 feet, two, whatever. Two homes yep. immediately to the east of the parking lot. Those are the two or, things. Or, or to the one that's right at the point there. Those three three lots. You could do the same radius circle off the other, if you're going to yeah. the other building. Do the yeah. same, just you want to write, plot it right on here. Mm -hmm. those, yeah. those are the same, exact same two item actions that I got out of the conversation yeah. as well. Right. Mr. Chair, uh, as a member of the construction industry, I mean, there is industry standards for how this equipment is manufactured, and those standards are what they are, and they meet all state codes across the country, if not around the globe. There's DB levels associated with anything that's manufactured. Uh, and I'm sure whatever they're proposing, it's either an or equal spec or it's a three name spec. Either way, the industry standards are going to apply. With all due respect to this board, you're not going to redesign the HVAC industry no. portal. So I don't know if we need to extend another meeting and call for spec and all this other stuff as the town's trying to get ready to build the school in the next couple well, of years. I, th I think there's other items. If we get to the end of this two hours and we're ready to vote, maybe we take another look at it. But I think there's a lot of beta items in the package where the drawings are not up to what can be approved by this board. So I don't think we're in a position at this point to approve without any conditions on the drawing package. That's, that's right. where I Right, I'd but be. I would just caution you not to try and get into re-engineering the entire project because a lot of what you're talking about now, it doesn't matter what you think. It is what it is. And the well, town is eager to build a school, and I'm concerned that we're going to get bogged down again for right. a couple we're, of We're eager to 
build a school too, but we're also very conscious, I would say, to protect the people that are surrounding this school from unreasonable noise. And we had one of the abutters that was not able to come tonight that said, geez, where I'm here, I hear the high school going. And that's got some protective barriers on it. And a lot of one of the things that when you do rooftop screening, which is not required under the Dover Amendment, is it, it does deflect some of the sound out on some of the units. So I don't know. I, I, would, I would agree as well. To your point, the back units, maybe putting some noise barriers on them for the future homeowners. That's all I would say. Not Maybe not so much control over what the decibel levels are, because your point, you have a standard, and, but maybe and, how to suppress when that. When I was providing some compressors and stuff, I provided lead lead foam pieces inside the panels which took the dv level from a screen down to something that you could reasonably be in the room so as a member of the, that type of equipment business i've done screening for it. let's move on at this point uh, expansion capability so as you can see on the plan here uh, this is our existing proposed school, so we have our academic wing, uh, kindergarten on the first floor, first grade on the second, and the pre-K with first grade above that, and our support services, cafeteria, gym, uh, music, art, and sciences. So over here, dashed in yellow, you'll see the footprint of an expansion for five classrooms that could go two stories, so an additional 10 classrooms can be built on this. So here we have the uh, lead checklist. So this project is going to be lead silver, um, which is a you know, leader in the industry that most schools are going for. Um, we're targeting 56 points, which will, which will bring us to that, that, that milestone. Uh, important to note is the MSBA, the Mass School Building Authority, will the towns that build for lead. And we get two extra percentage points on reimbursement, which uh, equates to a large dollar number uh, on your bottom line. Uh, some elements that are that included in the building are the photovoltaic array over the main entrance, uh, the cool white roof that uh, reflects uh, light in the boat's heat island, um, some bicycles, um, energy performance <coughs> windows, and uh, low emitting materials. Um, ask a question. Next yeah, to talk about, we have civil utilities. Yeah. I've got one quick question. So these, going back to the expansion capabilities, yeah. you can expand up to 10 more classrooms. Yeah. I think that's great if we need it. Do you have room to expand the parking for those 10 classrooms as well? So there's um, a good question. So obviously, if we get to that point, other opportunities would have to be given up, like playing fields would be at a premium. You don't necessarily need to expand 10 full classrooms at once. It could be a two classroom addition. Our goal is to show you that there's an expandability. It's future. And, and the that future. footprint, that knuckle there, is what the area would be, whether it's parking, the building, or other outside amenities. That's the zone that's uh, sized for expansion. And, and the core core part of the building, the cafeteria and everything, could handle another 10 classroom? It's yes. being sized so that it can handle expansion. If that many classrooms are added, we add another seating during lunch, but they can't handle it, yes. Just quick note on the um, solar panels. Um, I assume that most of the solar panel value is going to be during the summer and you're probably not going to be using much air conditioning so you I would think you'd plan on selling that back to the electrical company I know I, I obviously comes with it but um, and during the winter they wouldn't really supply much electricity is that what you guys it's are planning it for to sell it back to the utility company and, you know based on the size of this building compared to the size of our array it would be used for direct consumption whatever you don't use automatically gets sold back to the the sun still company. shines in the winter and it, it produces less energy, but in the summer, it produces I, a lot I have, of energy. I have solar panels, so I know how it works. So what I'm saying is, plan on not they contributing too much. I think, it's small, I think it's, you saying it's a small percentage of it's their it's overall small, electric right, use. Not, I mean, for the size okay. of the building that we're feeding. Okay. I mean, it was just a comment. It was just yeah. nothing to get bogged down on. Comment, but we're not proposing doing the entire roof. It's just a small area. Right. Partly for, a, you know, for educational benefit. Right. And obviously, the, you know, the sure. heater. And that is something we can expand in the future as well. Yeah, there's a there's a second array uh, earmarked on the gymnasium. Should it be desired to add that, we've, uh, we've earmarked <coughs> what that would look like and worked it around the other roof down in the area. Yeah. No, I wasn't trying to talk against it. I think it's no. a great thing. I was just commenting on it. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay.
I think we're checking off sustainability and expansion capability. I think on the next on the outline was the green look, roof before you get too far. I think that was Frank's question. I think most of us understand that it was taken off, but can you just address it for a couple seconds? Sure, we're, we're not proposing a green roof as part of this project. It was an idea that was floated out of the very concept of the project, uh, but it has not been part of our job for the past eight months since we restarted design development. It was a safety concern of the, the school to not want to put the smallest children out there on an active roof. This roof is always meant to be an educational tool. It was never meant to be green for the sake of looking at green. So it's not part of our project and not something we're proposing to comment. And that's okay with the committee and the committee uh, had lots of discussion. It wasn't unanimous, but the committee voted to support the school department's viewpoint, and that's why we're not proposing green roof. Okay. Uh, and the maximum building height, we'll check that one off. I think we've had enough discussion on that one already. Mm -hmm. Okay. So next, we'll talk about uh, fire safety in terms of the uh, hydrants and then the utilities. Chelsea will assess me. Yeah, I'm Chelsea Christensen, I'm an engineering civil engineer. We have a rendered site plan here showing the site utilities specifically targeted at the um, hydrant locations. The hydrants are shown here as blue circles off the, um, the main fire loop that loops through the site, connects back into Hayden Row. The hydrants are about 400 feet, feet apart, no more than 500 in the location. They're, um, feel that they're adequately spaced around the building. They have been reviewed. Chief, yeah, Chief do you have any problems with the f location of fire hydrants? No, they went over it with us. Okay. Uh, does anyone here have questions on hydrants? I have a question. The 15,000 gallon tank in the front, what is that for? It's for... Um, is that for water? For fuel or for water? The, the for tank fire? back here is... Uh, a fire storage tank because of the um, availability of water on the site. There's a similar one at, um, at the, this school behind the, the Hoffa School. That's right. That's right. Um, because of the, the flow that's available. Hopkins School has been very similar. And the issue is <coughs> the closer you get to these water tanks, the lower the pressure is. So without the storage, there's no more pressure for the fire. Run the sprinkler differently. So it's a pump in this thing that will pump that water into the system to put out the fire. So it's, it's, it, we're hoping to not have to do it. And probably once they build a new tank, it will be redundant for when they put new lines in to split the tank. But the plan is to put that tank in now. So. And it includes, like you said, it includes a, uh, a fire fire pump for them? Well, the pump is all part of it. And just to, to, so the board knows, we, we actually hired a a fire professional, and uh, he's, we're, we're actually paying him. He works with the fire department as well as the building department, and we probably spent three hours going over this plan probably a month ago. If he's happy. Any other questions from members of the board? We cut do the fire hydrants off the list. I think we've talked a lot about the access already. I think members of the board, you're comfortable with the access. We, we talked about that. I think. Off of EMC and then being able to get around the uh, the site. Uh, John, did you get? Yes. You're all set. Yep. Okay. And we're checking off the the last item of the bunch. John. Excuse me. Uh, the active uh, emergency emer planning. Emergency planning item. The um, we just discussed the road, and I think the the response from the police is the. The plan isn't developed yet because the school's not built yet, so okay. it's basically closed. Okay. It's not something we can consider now. Got it. Okay. Also, part of the slide presentation of the other utilities, as Chelsea noted, that are coming in from the roadway. We'll have a, a duct bank for electrical communications. We'll have our power. We'll have sewer, and we'll have gas. Those are all enumerated in the, the blues, reds, yellows, and greens, all coming off the main road. We've, uh, the other item was the utility poles. If you've driven out there lately, you've seen we cleared the brush this past week. Uh, so Verizon came up and staked the pole locations. We've removed the one above grade on camp on our campus, and it's now just a replacement kind of the ones along Hayden Row. 
and we're working on the detail here. On this closest one here that's right in the wetlands, so we're just uh, fine-tuning that with the Conservation Commission and uh, Verizon. We have a meeting set up with CONCOM on Monday and Verizon next week as well, just to narrow down the placement of that and make sure everything gets engineered. It's with Verizon and Eversource's engineering department for final evaluation and final spacing. Well, I guess we've kind of transition, transitioned into utilities. Yeah, I, the slides went together, so that's okay. Uh, that that, make, that makes sense. We, we let's let's do utilities right now. So we got the new poles. I think everyone's comfortable with the, just the movement of poles. What does that red line indicate? The red line is simply an area of revised work. I mean, the bubble form sure. in red. It's an area of revised work. Highlight where we've changed, changed utility poles since you last saw it. And obviously, electricity is underground. Gas is obviously underground. I don't think there's any. Is, is there an adequate main in, on Hayden Royal Street? For which service? For right? gas? Yes. Okay. Phone is underground, no problem. Checking through these cable. Uh, water, we've kind of gone through that. Go to the sewer. Uh, if I read the plans right, the sewer's running kind of flat. Is the engineer's comfortable with that? It's running at a, at a reasonable sl slope for a public road, which is what this is expected to co become at some point. For sewer service, it's a little flatter than what the regulations would want. But it's, it's running at 1% instead of 2%. And you know, we've um, brought that up to John Westerling. Um, it's it's uh, preferred to the alternative, which would be a pump station on site. Okay, so you're running flat. You're probably running more fluids and solids out of an elementary school. It's 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 really not that flat. Like One percent okay. is a good slope for okay. the sewer service. It really, you just increase the size of the pipe, and we have a um, very large sewer pipe in there already to accommodate the future. Um, development, which we don't know what that is, so we have a, a large sewer on site to accept flows. What size does the sewer mean? Excuse me? What size does the sewer mean? It's an uh, 8 inch. Okay. I think that we talked about solar, so that completes, in my mind, the utilities portion. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing nods. Okay. Next. So you've got the order. <laughs> so now we're back up. Uh, Get back up to K and L. Oh, by the way, if anyone from the public has some questions and comments, you're part of the meeting. This is the part that you're allowed to, you know, just raise your hand and try to get my attention. Sometimes my co or vice chairman here will kick me if I don't see you. <laughs> So we met with, uh, since we last talked to you, uh, we've now met with the abutters uh, at uh, 134, 136, 137. I think we're all in the room here today. Um, when meeting out on site, we talked about, you know, to really truly appreciate the impact, we'd rather to, f to determine the final details once they can see it, once the roadway is all clear. And the town has made a commitment to all three abutters um, that they'll provide a landscape buffer, whether it's uh, a, a nice fencing or landscape shrubbery, potentially some burned up soil. And those are some of the details that we're, we're working out with them. So uh, with 137, we'd be uh, thickening up the buffer in this zone here, and in 134 and 36, uh, potential for whether it's a, a fence or plantings in those zones there. And that uh, letter has been sent on town letterhead to the butters. We've made commitments to them in terms of drug callers associated with it, not to exceed numbers, and we'll fine tune the design the coming months and then the way the letter is written and reflected that in spring of 2018 six months before the building opens we'll all get together we'll look at the site we'll talk about what the impact is and then we'll move forward with whatever is finalized with those three abutters is what the mitigation is that they're looking for so we've earmarked the right amount of money we've negotiated with the abutters on what are the appropriate steps and we've turned it over to them to help steer it what is the right direction for their particular instances which are different Clarification. Uh, you're talking about the three abutters with the red uh, numbering. Yep. Uh, what about the abutters to the uh, north? Um, we haven't been contacted uh, by those abutters or had any direct discussions. If with you look at his house payment, payment 
displacement. The guy on the north is not terribly impacted, in my opinion. Maybe, maybe if he's in the room, he might have a different opinion, but the house is kind of on the north side of that lot. It's a full uh, public process. This has been out there for a long time mm -hmm. in terms of a project, and we were reached out to by the, the neighbors and directly contacted them back about moving forward. Uh, Jeff, when I thought I read your letter, I don't remember seeing any budget numbers committed to. No, in the initial letter is not, but we've had subsequent discussions. Um, we've done cost estimates based on some of the feedback we've collected from Mike and Dave, um, and in line with what we talked about with the greens too, pricing up tree calipers and fencing types that would meet their needs. Uh, this is a state-funded project, so it would have to meet prevailing wage, and so you, know, you can understand the number can grow quickly. Um, but we wanted to reassure them that you know, the range that we're looking is in a similar range to what we believe they would be looking for. So is, is the range according to Mr. DiStefano's email between $1 and $100,000? Is that what we were talking about? Yes. Well, typically this board... Well, no, I one dollar, though. <laughs> <laughs> it's closer <laughs> to the other number. <laughs> typically we this board... specific numbers with the abutters. Typically this board would, would put down a, a, a remedy for that. I mean, we typically approve a plan. I mean, that doesn't say they can't be changed in a year and a half. <coughs> There's got to be a baseline in, into it, and we'd certainly be putting in some kind of condition. And so while, while we're going through this tonight, let's, you know, we will have a condition that, that probably will spell out a fence and some bushes of some sort, as opposed to, and, and it can be changed as an administrative de de detail, but, but a letter promising to work with them doesn't cut it with, I'd say, our past practices of the war. And that's what we got a, a kind of a letter promising. Mike? Excuse me, you've had a lot of these letters from other town boards just like your board? Now, where, where are the school buildings? Right? We actually went out and reached out to the neighbors, two of which are right here. Two of which we've already forged numbers with them, and they're happy with the numbers. And they'll probably speak to that right now if you think to ask them. I think the number we're going to spend is probably in nobody's business except theirs and the elementary school building committee. And I can give you some assurance that we have enough money in the budget to cover what we talked about. Now, <clears throat> trying to plan something where we don't know the traffic impacts, we don't know the light, we don't know the noise, we don't know any of that is ridiculous at this juncture. The other part you have to consider is we're not a we're not a, a industry. We don't build widgets. Everything you add, however incremental, comes out of the town budget. It doesn't, we don't make more cars, we don't make more computers, we don't make anything. We just spend money here. And you're doing a really good job at it. So what I would suggest is ask the abutters if they're happy with the communication we have with them. And respectfully, you've got to respect the fact that the letter was signed by the chair of the elementary school building committee saying, we will take care of you. And it will be done before we Mike, are you receiver. asking this committee to treat you differently than any of the other people that come before this project, this committee? I mean, I hate to say it, but, you know, when the Dunkin' Donut goes in, we, we specify a fence, we specify the, the trees, we go through all the stuff. You haven't quite met the standard of what we're there. But that isn't Donut to say that... that they don't People spend an hour on the sidewalk with the, with the neighbors talking about who we're proposing to do. Oh, a, a lot of the people spend more than that to, to do that. Well, I don't want to hold this up any further. Just, just keep Ken, the Sluckman has a member. Yeah. So, uh, watching the cash flow in town, um, and I'm all for screening. I think if we need to uh, work with the abutters and make sure the screen's in place to meet your criteria and to meet the abutters' concerns. The money that we're talking about, a buck of a hundred thousand, I, I like that budget. <laughs> is that range in the budget for the school committee project uh, or building committee project? In other words, is that an add-on to this deal, or is that part of what the money is authorized? <coughs> Jeff, you can speak to that. It will, it will be part of the number that we have. Thank you. I mean. I think at the minimum, if we wanted to, to specify a maximum amount to be spent there. But most of our people also worry about their budget, particularly if you're a, a developer, in that you, in order to have it bounded, you can't so finance it. 
I can just help move this along. If you would like a linear footage, we'll commit to 200 linear feet of fence and 15 trees, and we can move forward with this. And then we'll negotiate and we'll deal with an amend administrative amendment at a future time. That's consistent are, with what we're talking the, about. Are the two the folks that are here we're happy with that? Are here. I, I, sir, are you guys? Yeah, absolutely. Two, Very much satisfied. 200 feet of six foot fence and leaving the type is out is okay in 15 trees? I sent some imagery that I think should be considered, but yeah. Okay. You just looking for a basis of design, we'll still work on Yes, the linear you footage and the, and the number of trees is adequate for my concerns. Okay. Yeah, yeah. state um, your name, oh, for the record, Kobe, did you uh, get? So I'm, I'm Nick DiStefano. I'm sure you guys know my father, Dave DiStefano. My grandfather lives at 130, lived at 134, so he wasn't able to be here tonight, so I'm just speaking on his behalf. Um, and again, I, we've had plenty of contact with everyone, and uh, I fully agree with that. 200 linear feet of fence, 15 trees, and at some point when the project is further along, we would figure out exactly what we did. Again, somewhere at the, the one for over 100,000 range here. And I'm Mary Green, uh, husband couldn't be here tonight, but we're 137. Again, happy with the communication to date. Honestly, I don't know what 200 fence you know, feet of fence looks like in 15 trees, but if there's some, you know, goodwill here negotiating and working it out through the process, is that. Okay, is the 200 feet of fence on the 134, 136? Yes. Correct. Yes. yes. Okay. They have an existing fence. Yeah, and, and part of the agreement would then be to allow the existing fence to stay, for I understand is that it's on town property at this point? That's one of the things we're working out with them when it comes to them being able to visualize it. We have the option to either move the fence or leave the fence, okay. and then that will determine how many, how many trees we can plant in that zone. Okay, and then and, and the town would pay for the movement of that fence right. or I'm rebuilding of it one if one required. Okay. Probably do a condition on that one too. Okay, I think at that point, are there other questions from members of the board? And so that kind of takes care Mr. of the Mr. Chair, I just want to underscore that the tree and the abutters, respectfully, is it has been very important for us. So I think you'll realize in this solution that's your fun to think. I'll take everyone on face value, but we, you know, we verify and we. And we approve only plans. We hope they're built that the way that we approve them. We've had some problems where people haven't built them to that, but that's not. We're not. We're not saying that you guys aren't doing that. Next up is our playground uh, presentation. Sure. Okay, so you asked us to show you the um, playground areas. We have two. One on the south side of the uh, pre-K wing, so you can see the driveway here going around the back of the school to the bus loop. This is the south facing entrance and exit um, that comes off the parent loop right here. And this is the pre-K play area. So um, this is the type of equipment that goes into that play area. Um, the entrance isn't rendered in this plan here, but this, the doorway is right here. So we have um, a seat wall and then this uh, play structure along with, I think we have another image of this too, right? Um, Okay, well, this is the, if you go back one just for a second, um, it has a, a, basically a loop that goes around it and a play area in the middle with the seating area there. Next. Next. Okay, so this is the K through one play area. This is the cafeteria. The main doorway coming out of the um, corridor is here. The doorways coming out of the cafeteria come out onto this brick, uh, sorry, concrete terrace. The play equipment is located in this area, an open paved play area here, which allows also emergency vehicles to drive through, and the play lawn out back. Um, we have a nature play element over here, uh, which connects through from this outdoor classroom to the west end of the building as well. And this is the type of equipment that would go in the slightly older children's play area of K to one age group. Spinners, swings, a climbing structure, and a teeter-totter. So the nature play element I was describing is up there on the left, and this is uh, another rendering of the um, play structure itself. We've met uh, three times with the subcommittee of the from, of the building <coughs> committee, and uh, this design is something that they've had a uh, direct hand in selecting the equipment and the layout. That's it. 
questions? I think there was only one question that, that had to, whether there was any shelter on the playgrounds. I, I know CPC paid for a shelter at Hopkins School just recently that was constructed by other, because there was a need for special needs kids not to be in the sun, but outside but not necessarily in, in the sun. So we have large shade trees along the south and west side of the pre-K play area, but the seating area over here, so this will be a, a corner that as the trees mature will become a shady sitting spot. We have this climber structure here that also allows kids to be inside of it that's outside of the sun and the canopy at the entrance. Quick question. I think I already know the answer to this, but it's all composite material, right? There's no pre-treated wood, anything we have to worry about rotting away, right? That's correct. Yeah. And it all meets the Consumer Product Safety Commission standards for safety and ADA. Um, the surfacing is a port in place rubber. We have a synthetic turf material around the perimeter. So there's, that's from a maintenance standpoint from our facilities personnel can, uh, not wanting to have to know it's Can I ask a question about that? Since you bring up synthetic turf material, there is in the Northwest United States, there's concerns over that rubber pelletized. There no, there's no crumb rubber okay. in the system. The system only has sand and it goes on a pad. Thank you. Everyone ready to close up play, playgrounds? Okay. Next. Um, we're asked to present uh, snow removal. So there was a question about snow storage. What's been highlighted here in purple is basically the cheap wall as you circle the campus of where snow can potentially be stored. So obviously at our future connection expansion here, this is our biggest area for what we call a snow farm uh, before that parcel happens. This is the driveway which we respect for whatever the future development is. You can see some storage on both sides of that. In and around the traffic islands um, areas, we have additional snow storage. This front island here and then this zone over here. Uh, around the back, we have some zones around the fire loop to make sure that it's all plowed and maintained. So um, the small areas are, are short-term storage. These ones are bigger, and obviously if we get another mammoth winter, we'll be, uh, we'll be trucking off-site um, as necessary. People feel comfortable? Just a quick note. Uh, touch base with the DPW on this by any chance? Uh, Al, you manage snow removal around the front. The, the DPW is responsible for clearing, but I, I You don't envision them having any issues with it, right? No, and, and it's, there's, um, there's a, a lot of storage, so we would, we would have the ability to push back rather than having them off. Thank you. Okay. Uh, last, we have our construction management plan to present. That include our slide presentation. So John Hudson is here from our construction manager, Paul Antonio Inc. Good evening, John Robson, Paul Antonio, General Contractors. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the structure management plan. Our intent is to start here, coming off of Hayden Row, uh, rubbing the site, removing all the trees, removing the topsoil. The first thing we'll do, of course, is public safety. Public safety is very important to us. What we'll do is we'll line the site completely with fence. We'll have a gate over here. This goes into EMC Park. This comes out on and in from Hayden Road, and that would be all gated. There will be signs all around this to keep out hard hat area, construction area. One of the things that public safety, as we need police details, we'll utilize police details. Perimeter protection, we just went over that. Emergency site access will be allowed at all times. The fire department, police department will be able to get in at all times. Coordination is a very another next very important thing is with the abutters. What we will do is we will put signage all up and down Hayden Road Street explaining the construction, the direction of traffic coming in, the direction of traffic leaving the site. Um, where our intent is to take half of this road here, put in the sewer and the water, pave it down roughly 200, 220 feet, so trucks leaving that site will leave most of the mud, hopefully all of the mud or anything in that. We'll be very conscientious out on Hayden Road daily cleaning up anything that makes it on the site as we come in. Logistics, material handling. We'll notify all our suppliers, all our contractors to do off-hour deliveries. In other words, not during peak hour times when the school is getting coming in and getting out. 
We'll take a look at the mitigation. We'll have rodent control throughout the whole thing, and we'll have noise control to the best of our abilities to keep it down so the aquatics don't be impacted. <laughs> okay, our intention here is to keep control of all the water. As you know, it's a, it's a water area. We'll be digging down here, we'll be pumping the water back up into these sediment floor bays, and it'll be going back off where it came from back into the system. Uh, as I said through here, we'll have half of it done over here. This will leave this open for the electric and gas service at a later date. The gas comes in at the end of the project. It's one of the last things that gets done. Uh, yeah. Quick question, Mr. Mr. Chair. Just yeah, the, the utilities, I know for the Legacy North Road that there was a requirement to cement uh, some of them in, like the, I guess the power and stuff. The electric, electric coming into the site, anywhere there's a traffic area and there's electric coming in, that goes, that it's all into concrete. Okay. okay. Question, Mr. Chairman. Do, so, do you propose to work five days a week or six? Five days a week, unless something <coughs> comes up that we need to work on the sixth day, we'll of course put through the proper paperwork and ask permission. Something might happen to where there's so much happening that we need that day to get it done so we don't interrupt the other schools. Quick question, what is an off-hour delivery? Just so I know for our name, for the neighbors, the abutters, as far as noise and trucks. Off-hour delivery, sometimes what's going to happen is we're gonna put up some, first of all, some no idling signs. It could be a truck, as it was put to me the other day, that could show up from Canada, and he got in a little bit early. We don't want him sitting there waiting, bothering the neighbors. So we will notify them not to be there that early in the morning. But I have to be honest with you, once in a while it happens, and we'll have to deal with that. Uh, are you posting the town? Uh, we have a uh, construction uh, time limits. Yeah. This is yeah. within within that. Yep. Yes, we are. And, and you're we'll posted seven a.m. to five p.m. Set to the whatever. The intent is only to work till five p.m. Uh, but they know the hours are from seven to seven and Saturdays from eight to four. Um, for all the abutters there, yeah. the police department does enforce those. So all you have to do is call them up if yeah. you find somebody outside that 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 range. And they're pretty good about they it. They all have my contact. They call me so in and we do our. Uh, you know, we've, we've run into occasions on other school building projects where the concrete that is set up by the capacity of and the floor finishers have to work later. In those cases, I've told the contractor to contact the building department. We'll work with the police department. Uh, those ca those things can't be avoided in a lot of cases. It only happens two or three times in the whole project, uh, if it happens at all. But we've, we've made accommodations for that. Are you, Mr. Chairman? Yeah. Um, will any of the um, material be in? removed from the project from the project site removed topsoil yes yes there'll be topsoil it'll be screened and saved there'll be some other soils beneath that that are all going to be removed from the site is there any reason we don't use those on the site or there's there there are materials like rock right that we can't reuse understood reuse as much as we can for stone walls for the existing and we're going to save them for later to do some landscaping with but as you get in there they're unsuitable soils there could be old lumber in there rotted wood in there what happened do you have an estimate of how many truckloads of stuff are coming off the site on an average on an average during the first phase of this when we're doing the trees and the grubbing you're going to average roughly 10 trucks a day I could speak to that. Sure, There's right. also a large field now. There's a, a lot of material field. coming on site. The materials coming on site, there'll probably be 30 to 40 trucks coming on site. Right Can we just have your name for the record, please? Uh, George Wilwood. Thank you. Another no question. Um, is there, once, once you start the clearing, there's going to be a lot of dust. Is there anything, any controls you have to control the dust and... and, and we're going to utilize, of course, it's a wet area, which helps us a lot, but we're going to use more water as we need the water to keep down the dust. We'll spray it. Other questions? Okay. Thank you.
Where so are we, Jeff? That our formal presentation. That brings us down to uh, agenda item O, which is the Conservation Commission. So we're in a parallel review with them as we are with you guys. Our, our next meeting is scheduled on next Monday. Um, the remaining open items there are finalizing the utility pole uh, location and then the, uh, the culvert itself. Okay, what's the utility pole? I can't imagine that being a significant issue. With no, we just, we've done a continuance to work with you guys the last two, so we haven't been back in front of them since. What's, what's the issue in the culvert? Is this the culvert that's fairly close to the entranceway? On Hayden Row. Yeah, in, in order to accomplish the widening of Hayden Row, um, we're now impacting the culvert that runs underneath Hayden Row, so we need to extend it by a few feet into the wetlands. Um, so that's a process we need to go through to conclude. So this is north of the driveway then? Correct, on Hayden Row. But you're not, how many square feet or so are you asking for wetland? You're not asking for anything outrageous, are you? No, is it eight feet? Um, I, would, I would say most for all the grading and the over. A couple hundred square feet. Frank, you any idea where they're going to be? Everywhere else you're outside the, the area, you, you have very right, little replication. The first, uh, well, other than the utility pole, utility company asked for the kicker pole. It's pre-existing, so it's an improvement, so I think that would be, if I was on the commission still, that's the way I would go, but um, okay. I have no other input. Nathan, do you guys have any comments on that? Um, well, yeah, certainly one of the items that we tag for outstanding issues. Um, I think the other aspect of that is that this, the detail needs to be just thought through in terms of uh, the grade down to the wetland. Is there a, a need for guardrail? You know, does height and slope uh, suggest that's appropriate? That may just increase impacts a little bit more than a simple detail. So I think that, that in general, the, the detail just needs to be thought through and presented to the uh, Conservation Commission. This guardrail is is on the same culvert that we're talking about. Correct. Yeah. I mean, we don't know that it's needed yet. I think someone's just got to think through the detail there and just determine whether there is a need or not. It may not be. Okay. Any more questions on that? Uh, I don't know. We'll talk about it maybe later or so as to how we can maybe handle that one. Good. Okay. We'd like to resolve it with Conservation Commission since it's directly in their purview in terms of impacts to the wetland. So if we get to the end of your meeting tonight, we ask for an additional approval subject to completing the process with wetlands in, in relation to that specific item. Okay, next. So I think the sidewalk network was closed, so stormwater management. Okay. Okay. If everyone's happy with the sidewalk, I think basically, uh, Stated that it's a Dover Amendment item, and we also have recommended to the DPW that Hayden Road be on the east side be a high priority sidewalk area. Just a question, Mr. Chair, about the sidewalk. I can't remember if we talked about it for the access road. Do we talk about that sidewalk at all? That the access road has a sidewalk on it, yes. Um, and it's but it's right on the street, right? It, um, is there any? option of getting a green belt in between that sidewalk. Sorry, which sidewalk are we talking about? The access road? Coming up, coming up from no. The, the no, no, the new the new yeah. the new road coming in. I guess Jim, do you want to take that sidewalk? No, the question is getting a green belt between the sidewalk instead of having the pedestrians right um, on the we're pinched between the wetland buffer on both sides, so it's okay. the road and the so sidewalk is zero lot line. Okay, so there's no room for it. Into the forbidden zone. Okay, the thanks. Um, just ask it, you know, for all the no, future projects. The yeah, we just like to get that in for, uh, for aesthetics and for safety. They want us to try and keep the wetlands clean, so we're trying to keep a little buffer on the other side to catch any uh, debris with some stone walls, too. Just going to squeeze a couple other items, related, somewhat related items. Uh, the there's berms on the, the street 
the access road. Oh, uh, curb. Curbs, yes. Yes, yeah, yeah. So the, the side with the sidewalk will have a vertical granite curb. The other side will have a cable car. Okay, thank you. And one more somewhat related. Go right ahead. You're on the roll. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, you brought up guardrails. You want to comment uh, before I, I switch gonna, gears? I was going to add something, but go ahead. So we haven't, as a board, haven't had a chance to talk about it yet, but I would like to push for the town um, moving towards wooden guardrails that we have. We have some in town, and they're much more aesthetic. Um, they're obviously supported with metal posts, so um, I don't know if that's something we can consider for this project. I don't, I don't remember what the guardrail detail. Do you have guardrails within in the project area itself? We have some. Yeah, the uh, WV, right, Kelsey? Uh, uh, yeah, it's a uh, highway guardrail, uh, galvanized is, WV. Is it an option if we can go with wooden on that? That's the down on fruit, like a uh, fruit street? <coughs> or, or the other or, option or that we, we used at Legacy Farm is the, the self rusting ones. Right. Or, or right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, something that's not shiny aluminum. So, so where are the guardrails per se? And then let's let's get back to the sidewalk issue too. Or the first question. There's one down along the wetlands where there is not the sidewalk. Okay. The cars are right off the, the slope, and the other is. So it's the entrance way. Of this area where there is a chance to go for the cars, come close to it. Okay, you get around the back loop where you've got that pretty big drop off. Does that sound like a reasonable request to look into, see if we could do something aesthetically pleasing? Well, I think wood guardrails are fine. Right? Well, the the I don't know what the cost of the concept yeah. is, but it's something we could look at. <coughs> okay. Like Ken said, if we can't do wood, maybe we could just do the uh, non-shiny. We, 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 we were proposing what we had on the plan, so we're trying to figure out, find out exactly what that was. We're hoping to get your approval on what we had in the plan. So just on the sidewalks, is there a, a, a goal even long term to put a sidewalk on the eastern side of Hayden Road? I think yes. that's what we're leaning that's toward. That's what we yes. want to do. Then, yeah, that, that would tie into the detail with the culvert, the wetlands and so forth, just making sure that there's room for that. But that's a town project, not this project. Right, but if you're building a culvert extension and a yeah. head wall, then you, you would presumably right. want to accommodate that now with that in mind. Mm -hmm. Correct. Is that something they've considered? That that would be part of thinking through the detail for the culvert uh, extension and the, the, the coordination with the conservation commission. Yeah. Our our understanding is the town has other intentions, whether it's the sidewalk or, or other things uh, beyond what we have in our scope for the uh, culvert extension. So our intentions <laughs> work with the town as we do our work to get done whatever else. I think Paul West, Paul Westerling at the DPW is probably the best person to work with, right, Ken? Yeah, but I mean, it sounds like we're going to need another five feet. Right. All, right. all I'm suggesting is there's a choice there that, that, that for the, for the, if there's a future plan for a sidewalk and you're building a head wall now, it seems to make sense that you're going to accommodate that, you know, as opposed to fixing it later. As we as we were at the culvert extension through con comments, that's what we would be doing. So we're very great. Jim, if I need to, what side of the guardrail on the sidewalk side or the other? Or is it on both? What side of the, of is the culvert extension? Of the, no, road, the, the roadway coming in. Coming so in so the guardrail is mainly on this side. On the southern side. Uh, on the, on the south side. side. There is a small stretch on this side, uh, 15 feet or so, but most of it's on the side of the Cape Cod Barn that faces the west. Okay, so it's not on the sidewalk side. Then. No, there's a small section off, but if this is the sidewalk and then there's the guardrail. So road, sidewalk, then guardrail. Just when it gets a little too steep because you're tipping on the edge of the home. No go zone. <laughs> too close. It's very similar to uh, EMC Park in uh, how it guardrail will keep the people from falling as well as the cars. <laughs> Playing board members happy with the sidewalk network per se. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that, that stormwater management, I believe, uh, 
latest comments from their letter are that you know, we meet the compliance standards and have worked out most items with the conservation commission. So we'll, open action items okay, we'll, uh, we'll get through all your yeah, beta yeah. stuff very shortly because we just got that letter today. So yes. we'll also kind of go through and serve that. I'm looking to check off a few more items. Um, Check off I. I is screening for the dumpster. And generating. And, and, and I think that was a closed item, wasn't it? No. Nope. Well, I, 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 I didn't, in, I looked through the, all the drawings. I didn't see any details for a dumpster or screen. <coughs> I saw a gate. I saw a gate in, the, in a plan view, but that's it. What were your proposal? The gate is basically, I mean, to find the detail, but if you remember, we're already locked in on two sides with the retaining wall from the playground and the building loading dock. And so it is a gate and then one cheap wall as it enters the loading dock. So it wouldn't look any different than what you found. Okay. I've, I've, throughout the plans, I've got all sorts of details, sure. I mean, pages and pages of them. I would have thought you would have detailed out what the dumpster does, the dumpster screening looks like. A wood fence that returns to a set of gates. If you found the gates, you found yeah. all I found is a plan view of things that swing. What page? What page are we at? L four point two. Can, can somebody find that? L one, L two, three point two, eight point one. 4.2. 4. 4. 4. 4. It's detail 5. Detail 5. Ah, I've, we found it. Okay. Wood fence is what it's called. Huh? Ah. Detail 6. Okay. Detail 6. 6. Detail 6. Item 6, yeah. It, 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 detail six is that what we're looking at? Yeah, which is can't wood fence. Game, we have to find the little guy. Find the little guy is just. Chairman, as we're looking at that, just to remind the board that the screening of the dumpster is one of the items that the Mass General Law and the Dover Amendment District Plan for us to regulate. But we did offer that we would provide the screening. Just to remind you. Greatly appreciated. Very much appreciated. Okay. So basically. In, in the generator, did, is there something in the landscaping around so yeah, that? Yeah, we added some tree, uh, perennial, shrubs? Evergreen, shrubs. evergreen shrubs around them, and as well as the ballers. Okay, and that, those details might be somewhere? Um, yep. Here, here, here. It's okay. On L3.1, you will see the generator, this little vertical finger here, and there's uh, five evergreen shrubs around it, and inboard of that is the bollard, so perfect. The, the greenery first, then perfect. the bollard, then the generator. Perfect. The same thing with the transformer, just saw it. Okay. Um, everyone happy with the eye? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So where are we now? Well, if you left off of uh, stormwater management, we just talked to the let's, previous comments. Let's go back to lighting, because I'm not sure I'm where we are in lighting. Is that I, I, I first day? couldn't make any details out of the plan that I received. It was too small for me to read. Yeah. You can get a bigger one. But let's let's just talk about what, what's in the plan for lighting. So we put 15 foot uh, light poles. Um, with a dimmable driver, um, so it meets the needs of the project. And although at full capacity can be greater than the lighting uh, light or bylaws, can be adjusted to that level, light level as needed. And we zone it based on grouping the lighting, so the, the throat of the roadway would be one lighting, and then the two parking lots would be two other surfaces, so that it would be dimmed to varying points of necessary. Light levels. If you, and this is a question for Beta, if you dim all of a zone, do you reduce the 
hot spots per se? It would it would go down relative to to the dimming, so so the uniformity would stay the same at a lower level. Did we meet the uniformity standards at all? Um, the uniformity uh, the, the uniformity is there. Let me just see if I have the chart there. Summary chart you provided. Just to be clear, this is maximum, not regular operating levels. Correct. What's the maximum, uh, Lumens? Uh, this is on foot candle. Or foot candle, I'm sorry. Five. I don't know it's about five. If we ever need to send a message to space, we can flip them on. Uh, sure. Preferably here, we'll be referencing the whole three in the middle of the zone, which is But standard operating light levels will be lower. Mr. Chair? Yeah. Jeff, the poles in the middle of the front parking lot, the center there, yeah. are those poles right in the middle of the parking lot? or? something like that for a parking lot. You're probably looking at quite a few more fixtures to the point where I think you would question the benefit of that appearance versus the cost of doing it. Can you clarify that benefit versus cost? You would, you would have to, the way you handle uniformity is you basically add fixtures. So, so in a lighting pattern, you get you know, obviously the intense light around a fixture and you get a, a, a darker spot in between. The calculation is basically looking at an average between those darker spots and those lighter spots. So as you make a more dense lighting grid, you get a more even pattern. Thank you. I think a lot of that is inherent in the lower pole. With yes. It's, it's you can see the uniformity has actually changed from the higher to lower pole when you look at these calculations. And by about that factor, in fact, you're going from five to say eight or four to ten. You know, I think the lighting standards really talk about trying to get this uniformity because that makes it better on your eyes and a little bit safer, I think, because your eyes adjust to where it is. But since we've gone to the lower pole level, I don't see where we've done a good job of achieving it. And you always, no matter what, you always are going to have those, the, the base of a light is always bright. 
always. Uniform, I mean, it would be difficult to walk down the street and say that's a uniformity of five foot cannons versus seven, for example. But you could certainly see a difference between a one foot candle maximum and a three foot candle maximum. One would certainly appear brighter. So in context of this project, though, the, the lighting that's going to be happening on an everyday basis, uh, controlled from Al's phone or whatever, through the apps, uh, we don't have a light map of that right now, do we? And it, but because we don't, not that we need one necessarily because we have the maximum, but, and I'm referring to a comment in, 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 a, in, a, in a report here. Um, you're leaving, you know, it's, it's, you're giving us information, they've resolved the question, but it's really up to us to... Yeah, the, the issue we're raising here is really one of, of the average light calculation. That's when we look at a lighting calculation, that's what we pay most attention to. So, for example, from um, the 20 foot poles in the west parking area of the chart, you've gone from an average of 1.5 to 2.3. And part of that is also the, the, the pole height. An average lighting intensity, uh, according to our consultant, might be, say, one foot candle in a, in a, in a parking lot. So we're a little, a little brighter here, up to two. However, the, the point we raise in our comment is these parking lots, particularly the lower lot, the westerly lot, has pedestrian activity associated with it. And if you were designing, say, a street situation, you would look to light areas where there was pedestrian activity a little light a little higher for example an intersection you might see intersections at a roadway at two plus so the comment that we're making here is considering it's a dimmable um, product that you have the best of both worlds in a sense that if there's some concern you can downplay it it has to be circuited properly um, if um, if it was too low in a standard system then there's nothing you can do about it. So our feeling was well, there's some flexibility here. Yes, it's lighter than a normal standard, but you have the flexibility to address it if you choose to do that or if a concern arises. And that was our opinion. The board may you know, have more sensitivity or more concern about that. If we were looking at a non-adjustable system at 2.7, we'd probably be saying you can, you can cut back on that. On this table, it says max slash min on the last row. What is, what is that supposed to be telling me? That's the ratio, the maximum below the light to the minimum, and that's not a measure that's usually paid attention to. It's the average to min that's usually paid attention to. Chair, can I ask a question on the beta? Go ahead. I'm by no means a light expert at all, but just when I look at this map, I look at the upper parking lot and I see that it's fully lit, but I look at the lower parking lot and I see the gaps there. Yep. Is that something worth putting more poles in? Um, it's, it's, uh, I think to, to address that, what we probably want to look at is, is the, the detailed lighting grid below this plan. I can't see the numbers up there, but the opposite might in fact be true. It might be the, the upper lot that you want to say, pull okay. a pole out. Sure, okay. And the beauty of what we're proposing is that you know, it meets your requirement of the height and it is dimmable, so it should need to be dialed back. The parking lots and the roadway will be on separate circuits, so we can do that. I, th I think we can write a condition that makes that work. Okay, sounds good. Jen started one already. Great. Claire? Um, I'm remembering that this school is serving pre K through first grade. And with the exception of back to school night or ten years picnic type thing, or maybe it'd be used for an occasional function, the majority of your customers are going to be in bed before it even gets to dark. Um, you know, I think the five foot candles sounds like a lot of light, but in practice, there is no reason that this parking lot for most of the days needs to be lit like this at night at all. Um, I, I'm glad you're talking about dimmable, and, and I know that in the new LED lighting now, um, especially when you're starting from scratch, you can do all kinds of programmable things. Um, it would seem to me that, you know, for security, we maybe need lighting on the buildings, but then these parking lot lights for most nights when there's nobody there, um, 
there's no reason why this can't be turned down to just a minimum amount of light that, you know, if the police have to go down and do a security check, they're not going into a really dark area. But this building, these, these well, parking I, now, I, I, I suspect I know they're not going to be, I'm going to declare, uh, that, that gym is going to be used, at least if experience serves correct. Basketball, boys basketball, girls basketball is going to be going okay. every, every night, night yeah, to work to, to us. Just here. I think All right, but I certainly know that one of the things that we've been wanting to encourage them to the build it is communities. Mm -hmm. um, and so we would hope that it's going to be widely used for not only sports, but also community activities that take place at night. But um, there's going to be cut off for that, too. At okay. a certain point, um, it just seems to me that. The surrounding and just just for saving this energy, that we should look to be turning these down significantly. I think that's the plan. Yeah. The, 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 the uh, three, Mr. Chair, the school department's really excited. They have this is the only school that will have this kind of sophisticated lighting system, that LED lights, mm -hmm. dimmable zones, and the superintendent has committed to work through operations, the reality of operations for the yeah. first few months to figure out what's the right setting for those zones, but you're right, this is the maximum here, you won't see this, and it will be different. Okay. I think we're all yeah. set on lighting. Quick question, does that bring, bring back to, um, from the meeting before this, are we talking about 3,000 Kelvin uh, versus 4,000 Kelvin lights? I think it's a 3K, but it, it should be on the lighting plan. Yeah, we, we talked about street lights <laughs> in the first half hour of the meeting, so uh, if everyone likes 3,000 Kelvin one much better than 4,000. Well, not only that, but it was just approved by it was the yeah. ANA. Yeah. Yeah, apparently all the towns so far have been using 4,000, but the new standard is 3,000, so we're lucky we're going to go with that. <coughs> Thank you. Right. Okay. Well, the Checking things off, yeah. Yeah, if I remember correctly, we, we, we got anyway. kind of a non-committal letter from Design Review Board, so they were all set. Yeah, they looked at it over the course of one night and didn't have any issues, so. Okay. Um, I had, before, my time. before we get to beta comments, we, we had a, a list of uh, items that uh, were kind of outstanding from the last meeting, and let me quickly go down the list of ones that we haven't touched. Like this. Here the noise one, uh, the pedestrian light. Uh, where did what did we decide to? What did the engineers come up with for the light? For what? The crossing. Crossing light. The, oh, so uh, we had a conversation <coughs> with Beta uh, today, and they felt that the vertical uh, pedestrian light without the arm was an acceptable installation in this location, so we can move forward that recommendation. Jennifer, why don't you write that up as a condition while we're thinking about it? Because I believe the plan set shows maybe shows one of both. each, doesn't <coughs> it? Because well, it was one on one side anyway. Right. So, both. so basically, we just you use the You have the, the detail. Yeah, both we can flip it. And that's item T35 in the beta comments, the last page. Okay. Um, Let's see. Okay. Question for the widening, widening for the DPW's person, uh, DPW's direction, director's concern regarding inter intersection geometry. But you felt there was room for widening, but wanted to see it sketched out. We've gotten all that. Yes. And everyone is happy with the Q length on Hayden Road to the left turn lane? Yes. Yes. Do you want to comment on that? Or? Okay. So yes. So so um, there, there there were two, there was one common defendant on memo which which we wanted the applicant to address, which which relates to a technical traffic thing, peak hour factors, which is distribution of traffic during those sort of peaking events you see at, uh, at an intersection. So they looked at that, they redid the analysis, um, and it looks like the 150 foot long turn line is is fine. Um, the only thing we would just note uh, as a consequence of that is is the operation the intersection under non-traffic control like a guard or police control is basically going to 
hold people in uh, hold people in the northbound through while the left clears out. Then they'll let the left pick up again, let the northbound through go. So the one comment we would have is you will see some queuing in the northbound through lane. Um, length of that, um, we feel it could be in the you know 300 plus possibly 500 occasion foot sort of dimension. We did talk a little bit about that today. It depends upon the peak traffic that's coming on northbound Hayden Road. This is an off-peak period, 9.30, but there is a variation in those numbers. So it will vary, but you will, you will see some queuing on that northbound approach. So basically, because the 150 feet won't no. necessarily... It's for the northbound we're talking about. Right, yeah. right, but because the left turn lane will have to get cleared out at a higher priority than the northbound, they they will you will go northbound you will suffer I so the, yeah you're right the correlation is if you make the left turn lane twice as long which you probably wouldn't want to do in this sort of setting but the northbound traffic would have more opportunity to to, to continue through so basically the guard is going to see whenever the left turn folks clog it up yep. he's going to say whoops i got to stop the northbound and, and clear that out correct right. and that's what the human guy can do pretty yep. well. And, and my take is that the originally was 50 foot and we've got it increased to 150 right. foot, so I think that's... a lot more cars to yeah. appropriate queue is now available. Right. And, and buses, too. Mm -hmm. to minimize okay. the impact. Okay, I'm, I'm just going through the list of things. Uh, I think in when we talk go through the beta list, the parent parking lot traffic flow, which was an action item for beta, uh, you're going to talk about that in a whole detailed list of things, right? Yeah, we, Got so a number of <coughs> related to that. So, so we'll, we'll defer that off of this list. There was a question of whether the sledding hill was far enough away from the forest pavement. So we've shaved back the dirt mound on your updated set of plans to provide a little more buffer there. That's been resolved. Okay. So Park, sorry for the, the comment. From a perspective, I can tell you that we've, we've, we've voted, uh, we've uh, been in communication with this group all through this process that they're worried about coming in and you just need to really have it. We have to take a vote on this specifically you know about it being concerned okay. with this, this sledding hill that has eroded through the years. I drove through there. Looks like it's only about um, 12 or 15 feet high now. Um, I, I'd be happy to bring it to, to the commission for our, at our meeting next week to, to vote on, but I don't need to take any kind of a concern on that, so that, uh, that mound. You might have an opportunity to leave a mound or two of dirt over on the, the southern part of this <laughs> process and create a very nice sledding hill. Uh, just keep a couple of those dump trucks off of. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's not over space. Okay, close that one out. Forest pavement. I think I saw it in the plan where it does talk about clean, and we have a potential condition for that one. Yep. That's will be happy. Um, Lighting, we've got that all set up. So basically, I think we're on to beta comments at this point. So let's just go through your letter, and why don't you just take us through the open items? Okay. So, so the letter you have in front of you is really the result of, of uh, the first letter, which I think we issued on July 5th. We've had several meetings, several conference calls, some draft back and forth the board didn't see that's really resulted in the status you see today. <coughs> the most recently had some conversations today. So so this is you know quite literally part of the press. Um, you can bring us back to any items you want. The yellow highlights are areas where we felt that there was an action or a consideration. Um, I think we're in black and white. Yeah, or black we're in gray. So oh, you're in gray. So gray. This is gray. Yes, you see in the gray shade. So the first one is on page Scary. two. It's article uh, 12, Water Resources District, number one. Um, you've heard this already. Uh, two uh, issues before the, uh, for the Conservation Commission right now which need to be resolved. One is the utility pole placement, and the second is the culvert and head wall that we, we talked about before. Both of these are roughly in the same location, just north of the driveway. Um, not complex issues, but it's more of a process issue that needs to be gone through and approved by the Concom. Jen, is there a way we can condition this one? I believe there is. Okay. Just you can condition it. Start thinking. 
thinking about a lot right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We see the smoke coming out of your ears. Can you make it subject to the approval of conservation? I think so, yeah. Just work on, I'm working on the other ones right now. Second one is on page four. Item N1, you just talked about that. That was the lighting. Mm -hmm. uh, the Okay, I was well, is board members comfortable with lighting I think we were so we yeah. consider that one closed. Yep. Okay. G thirty one page nine. nine. G thirty one. So this refers to um, a culvert crossing. As you turn into the school driveway about 50 feet down between the two uh, wetlands sandwiching the driveway, there's a culvert crossing there. The culvert's um, fairly shallow, it's a fa fairly large, I think it's three by, um, three by five, I don't know if you can, three by four. Uh, fairly large, shallow cover, so the only issue we're highlighting here is just making sure that utility crossings are properly coordinated. It would appear that most would need to go under shouldn't be a problem, but you know, attention just needs to be paid to make sure the details thought through the sections drawn. Particularly the gravity utilities are I think, considered because you've got less flexibility with those. So it's more of a detail issue than it is anything else. So it's not a condition, it's more of a we hey there it is we in have black a plan. white. We can send it to you for record to make it into the set for the Yeah, we have a section through the culvert showing how everything's problems was not in any more documents. Yeah, and the last thing is just some, some simple wall elevations, top and bottom of the wall, just so that they get the wall, you know, position. Yeah. Yeah. So details are there, and, and obviously everything works. Okay, let's consider that one closed with the submittal of, of that for the record. Yeah. The condition is that they submit it for the record. Uh, no, we're, we're gonna. They have it tonight. We're, but you've got a copy of it somewhere tonight, hopefully, or electronically. Not with the head wall detail. Okay, it's condition is condition that is submitted for the record, and we'll trust you. Okay. Uh, page ten, G forty. Okay, so we've talked about this one too. This is the culvert crossing, just on Hayden Row just north of the um, driveway, uh, extension into the wetlands, positioning the headwall, et cetera. So we've talked about that. The only other comment that, that we have here is, typically if we were doing an intersection job uh, with, a, with a CMP pipe, which is a corrugated metal pipe, the longevity of those is, is questionable. It may be in good condition, it may not. We typically, in those kinds of situations, just replace the entire pipe for the crossing of the roadway. So we're just making that suggestion to but if you're in there, if you're rebuilding the intersection, make that corrective action. If the condition of the pipe is good, then that's a risk that the town can assess. Um, as I say, normally you would look to remove those. So there's a, there's a the second part. Again, we're going to have to work with the town on, on those details because there are a lot of other items associated with that that are sidewalk that you brought up earlier and whether or not that, that crossing wants to be replaced is really outside the school scope, but it's, it's something that we need to work together on to see you know, how much is going to be done the school. Clarification, that would be with the DPW department? Yeah, correct. Yeah. Jen, I, I think we can write a condition sure. that says that you're going to work with the DPW director on, on that culvert construction details. That get us off tonight. Page 11. Um, I'm sure I have some questions about G46 through the end. I guess where a lot of them say plan update required. Yeah, that's just as well. So, so what, what that is, is it's a, a situation where we've agreed as to what, what needs to be done. We just haven't seen an updated plan. That was all in relation to the circulation through all of the parking lots and any pavement markings or signing that, you know, should be added 
um, to you know reinforce those one-way circulation patterns. Matter of timing, we sent our plans in too. They got those additional comments Tuesday. So ships passing in the night. Can you and give us? They're the all related to just wayfinding signage on the campus. Can right. you give us a gist on what the decision was? Was it mostly the pavement? Well, let's go through them. Yeah, so okay. Right. Okay. Sure. I mean, okay. Basically, our, our overall philosophy is we feel that pavement painting on the pavement is a much more effective tool of reinforcing bad, uh, good habits of traffic yeah. versus smaller signs that are mounted on skinny poles that kind of get lost in the line of sight when parents are looking around the roadway at other areas. So. Our team's philosophy is we'd rather spend more money and time on the pavement markings. Beta's philosophy is they'd rather see the vertical posts. So we've compromised in some locations and we're, we're doing some signs but not all. In some cases they want to do not just signs flagging both sides of a driveway. So we agreed to put it on one side and do the horizontal pavement marking. So okay. there are two signs covered, just how we divide that up. Thank you. Okay, so let's let's go. G forty six. This is just that's resolved. We agree to it. G46 is agreed to. G47 is agreed to. Okay. G48 is one of the areas where we talked about uh, what felt one sign was sufficient. I think. I, uh, well, I think our position there, Jeff, was was it was two. It was one on each yeah. side. Those were the two. Do you mind yeah. those out? If I can uh, use this thing here again. Uh, we'll get you a better one. What was the resolution on G48? That's the one he's talking about. Yeah. So we were extending the stop line. Uh, it's half the width of the road, now it's going the full width. So pavement marking is associated. And then on the right side is a light pole. We're going to have a do not enter sign uh, mounted to the back of that pole. So basically, it's not if it's a problem, you're going to add it. No, we're adding one of them now. And if we needed an additional second sign, which in this case would be the third symbol. We could add it at a later date. So uh, what G48 deals with is the intersection right here where your one-way loop road around the uh, parking area uh, comes into the main driveway. As folks are coming in on the driveway, if they're in this left turn lane, um, which we've asked for more of the uh, the arrows and the onlys um, <coughs> along that, they're saying, okay, I'm in a left turn lane and I want to turn left into the parking lot, but they cannot turn left into this one-way driveway. So we're looking for the two signs here just to reinforce <coughs> that, yes, you're in a left turn lane, but you can't turn left here. You have to keep going to the, to the end to turn into that end. Um, so that, that was the, the crux of G48 with that one location. So G48, you want signs on both uh, on both light poles? Yeah, both sides of, of that driveway just to reinforce that, that uh, restriction. Discussion? Yeah. I, I tend to uh, agree with Beta on this. Uh, someone who's new to town or new to the school, um, are not familiar with the school, they're going to want to turn left as soon as they can if they're in a left lane. Um, That's fine. In the interest of time, we can move forward and provide a second. So we'll have a stop sign plus two. So we'll have three to signal as well. And we'll still get somebody going through it. Yeah. Yeah. Just ask, if you're not supposed to be turning into there, can you just prevent that by um, configuring the, the, you know, shape there that prevents or, or clearly sends a signal, you know, you pull that little island out so that you it's clear that you really can't so turn So if in we there. did that, we'd do it with a strat, a, a hatched paving yeah. paint, not with a physical barrier because we want fire trucks to be able to get down that way yeah, if they yeah. need to, so we wouldn't want to do a curve. But yes, we've done that in other schools where instead of extending the stop line across, you kind of paint the ground so it kind of curves the cars out. I mean, that's but but I can see where in the future with that other driveway that's not shown there going off to the other part of the parcel, you might want to come out of there and then go on over to yeah. whatever we build there. That's again why you do it in paint versus yeah. you know, hardscape. That's something to be retrograde. So we'll go with the stop sign across and we'll add the do after sign. And that takes care of 49. Um, G49 
So 49, we're in agreement with you that yeah, the future condition will determine. So it was the request to add. Go ahead. Yeah, so we are, we are looking at uh, placing do not enter signs south of these driving aisles on this side and then north of the driving aisles so that if someone's coming down the aisle, they know that they can't make a right, that they can only go left and, and recirculate around. Um, but in, in discussing um, you know, the, the frequency and sort of sign clutter, um, we agreed that you know, a limited number um, is appropriate. And then if after this has been operating, um, there's you know, issues, then you know, corrective measures could be taken at that time. Sounds like everybody's in agreement, right? Yep. Um, kind of to go along with those, at the end of the island, we had recommended uh, one-way signs and a graphic no right turn sign. Um, and I believe that. Um, we no left turn. Oh, we're in agreement on that. Yeah. So, yeah. So no, no, no right turn. No right turn. No right turn. Coming out of the parking lot. Yep. Okay. So the no right. fifties, everyone's happy with. Sure. Yeah. G fifty one. We are. In agreement, this is uh, additional pavement marking. Okay. 52 will be addressed. will be addressed. 55. 55. This uh, deals with a similar situation. Uh, vehicles coming around the corner, coming up to. Uh, you know, maybe access this parking lot. Um, as they're coming up, they may have the tendency to want to keep going, even though from this point around is one way. So we're recommending uh, the do not enter signs on both sides of the roadway, um, just at the, the head of that bus loop. Okay, so basically what I'm seeing is 52, 53, 54, and 55 are Everyone's got agreement on? No, I think we're just talking about different. 55 right now. Oh. 55 is what I, I just discussed. The, 55, uh, because it's a yellow line that leads to the back, you have to cross an unbroken yellow line, which is why we didn't feel it was necessary to add two do not enter signs at the bus loop. Again, these are two different ways to skin the same cat. We're, we're agreeing to one, so again, it goes back to our position that between the pavement marking one vertical sign we felt covered. So you'd be happy with one do not set a sign for 55? Were board members happy with one? Yeah. yeah. Okay. 56? 56. Uh, in the plan, uh, there's a, uh, a curb ramp on this side and then uh, a connection between the parking lot and the, the driveway, but there was not a, a striped crosswalk uh, we recommended striping that, um, you know, as folks come out of the gym um, and cross over into the parking lot. Um, that would, you know, well, we're going to gonna incorporate that. Yeah. Okay. 56, um, 57, um, all the yellow lines down in this area is shown as a single line. Uh, we we're recommending just to show it as a double line additional emphasis and uh, I guess everyone's comfortable with that, that. Double line. Well, yeah. okay <laughs> and then uh, 59 was just to add a uh, signage um, along this approach to indicate where folks that are uh, dropping off students or that are visitors to the building where they should be going to park um, and then where faculty and uh, buses should be going to fuel the bus, just to provide some guidance to. Jeff, you're happy with that one? Yeah, we just changed the wording of it. So what's the title is 60 is actually our response. So instead of having a more wordy version, we just had visitor drop off with a left arrow and then staff parking and buses with a straight arrow. So we're agreeing to the concept. We're just making it a little more readable as you drive past it. 
Okay. I think page 18 is the next one. T33, unless I made a mistake. Uh, yeah, we're in resolution with all the main comments. Uh, we get to uh, T33. So going through um, a response that is provided, um, there was a question that came up on you know the sufficient uh, capacity of this lot to handle um, drop off and pick up activities uh, with parent parking and, and students. Um, the the morning peak is. Uh, spread out a little bit more um, and it's it's a little bit of a quicker operation where parents would come in from what we understand um, and drop off and they would leave uh, pretty quickly um, our understanding is that in the afternoon um, parents would come and you know as much as an hour or 45 minutes before um, school lets out up until the moment when school lets out, you know, uh, parents are arriving, vehicles are arriving, um, they're parking or queuing up um, around the car loop and um, waiting for that dismissal period. Um, so uh, our concern was that the, uh, the volume of or the number of spaces and the, the queuing capacity um, around the loop uh, may not be uh, sufficient um, when uh, you consider this turn lane um, that just brings us into um, uh, equilibrium where you have uh, supply equal to a projected demand or an expected demand um, so we, we're showing or the opponent is showing 136 entering trips 25 of those will be buses, which will come up to the upper lot, uh, so they don't uh, count in that. So that leaves you with about 111 vehicles that are looking to park during the PM dismissal. Um, we're showing that there's 86 spaces in this lot. Um, at the last meeting, it was discussed that there were seven um, spots that could be um, occupied by visitors or other staff um, so that brings you down to 79 spaces that are available um, so they've uh, assumed that you could fit 18 vehicles around this loop um, so that brings you to a total of 97 um, available parking spots which is about 14 shy of what the uh, the entering demand of 111, um, but it's uh, it's been suggested that you could queue an, an additional 14 vehicles in this lane um, until something opens up and then they could move in. Doing that really, you know, that's you know like trying to carry five gallons of water in a five gallon bucket. If you move it at all, you're going to slosh some over the side. So if anybody additional comes, you know, they're starting to, to queue back here. Um, you know, it's, uh, I believe we had recommended, you know, considering if there's any additional area to um, create a small staff or employee lot 
um, somewhere else on the on the campus that would at least open up seven spots in this uh, in this lot um, to provide some free board where uh, if you end up with more cars on Sunday you have some some slack to uh, to accommodate them. So what, what are you, the summary is that the design fits the projected demand but you know if there are an increase in demand and everybody arrives at the same exact time and the parking lot is full with all the staff that will have filled the left turn queue lane and that potentially we could be blocking our buses if the, if the if it exceeds 15 cars here we could block that bus but again we'd only be impeding ourselves <coughs> In this zone here. So what we could do is, if we have that demand, instead of having the queue start here, we could rotate it over, you know, to this point during those you know, heavy rain days or, or days where it's an issue. Um, the other important thing to note is that the school has started free busing starting this September, and uh, we believe, at least at this point, it's going to be an uptick in that usage, which should be a downtick in the parent pickup. So that should help it for the better. Obviously, two years from now, that proof will be in the pudding with whoever has taken that opportunity up over the next two years to get to that point. So we feel there are safety valves, whether it's extending the queue, some internal blocking of ourselves, and the, the, the off-shift bosses that there should be, it should work as proposed. Chairman, just to, just to underscore something Jeff just said, uh, the, the, all the, the numbers we're talking about are assumptions based on observation of parent pickup at center school. We believe there will be less now that the free buses are in place. I asked the transportation director for the schools who sent out forms to parents at center school how many to, to indicate whether they plan to take bus or not. And as of a few weeks ago, only about a dozen have said they plan not to take the bus. How many currently yeah, take the with, with free busing? They're willing to, to go on the bus. Is that what you're saying? Yes. <laughs> okay. There'll be more taking the bus. So how many currently take the bus? I mean, not sorry. Currently, do the parent pickup at Center School? This, that's what this number. One eleven. One eleven is the current number. Yeah. Well, I think I think you've also yeah. not taken 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 exact. into account the overflow at EMC. There's going to be 10, 15 smart parents that are going to go in and out of that parking lot and, and, and do a little exercise with their kids. I mean, they'll have to still walk over there. But yeah, they'd have to walk over because they have to be released over there. They'll be right. released yeah, over there, but sure. maybe not on a, as so much on the wet day, but even so, I, I think there's going to be a lot of parents playing with their kids over on the on the playground over there and walking over. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I mean, just the, you talked about the queue. Going to dictate that queue, the parents, or do you have it actually? We will have it actually with signage, as far as I mean, it, it works well on your drawing. But <laughs> give me a break. You mean like the starting point, yeah. I mean, the, the, yeah. the start line will have to be defined by the by the school. We'll have to put a sign that says this is where the queue, queue up starts, here. and they're going to walk that student that. out. We're currently doing that now at two locations. We have two lines. So the parents are aware. And, uh, if you want your kid, this is where he's going to be waiting for you. <laughs> do they have teachers outside that kind of direct that traffic a little bit as well to kind of, I don't know if they do or not. not and, and yes, there's a handful. Every right, and that would kind of move them to as far as possible. Here, as the upper grades would just float the door to the back. Yeah. So you're saying the teachers are going to release the students not by the door, but all the way here by the <coughs> turn? Do you have a feel for how many more? We don't love right. the roadways That's forever, right. but right. You know, somebody's out there. Parents got to take cars at a time. We've got to get some exercise. I think, and, and, and you know, at least one member of the Tadaro, Reverend uh, Tadaro studies here, is in their plans, they might want to reserve closer to the school a potential employee parking lot that, if it, if it, we see it in two years, we've got we've got the solution for it. I mean. I think most of the time, you know, we don't want the traffic to back out on the Hayden Road. That's for, for yeah. absolutely sure. Bad. So there's always a terminology question. I consider the beginning of the queue the first car, but some people think it's the end because that's where you start. But for so the beginning, you can extend that forward, right? Do you have a feel for how many cars you could, if you had to, fit in that curved area? The, the, uh, 
that's 18 graphically now, and if you inverted that on the opposite side, there, you can see you get another you know, 15 cars. Here. 15 cars, thank you. I actually think that this is really, you know, as it was stated, this will probably be a non-issue because of the free busing. Okay, so let's let's just consider that one closed. 34 is a ticket that we need to check in that field to so understand it. So, of course, we'll, uh, we'll follow through in that recommendation. I had to do a kind of merging the school zones to make sure that we have the right to do that in terms of zoning between the other schools in the school. Let's get caught up. DOT response. What is the concern? Is, it, is this north of the school? Because we just wanted to never get out of a school zone. Is that what the what the plan is? Yeah. Yes. So as you're coming from the south, going north, um, you'll enter the school zone for this new school, uh, 250 feet north of the driveway. That school zone will end. Technically, you'll go back to a 40 mile an hour speed limit for about a thousand feet and then you hit um, where the the speed limit drops down to 25 so you go 40 20 40 25 oh, on Hayden Road on yeah. Hayden Road yeah it's catching the driveway um, so what dictates those zones sorry mass DOT. Mass DOT. no but the length out that, that the mass DOT detail in, you know and they have jurisdiction because it's a numbered road yeah, it's 250 before you get to the driveway and 250 after. Um, so the, I think uh, the suggestion was, can we just elongate the, um, school, the zone. school zone past that 250 just to bridge that 40 mile an hour gap? Um, I think to do that, you would need to go to MassDOT to, to get their concurrence. Um, the, the fact that we're using EMC Park as a parking lot for the students, can we add another 250 going that way from that? Um, no, because you won't have students crossing the street. Oh, to, to the high school they are. Mm -hmm. But All that's, high school. In, that's in the high school. school oh, zone. they're parking in EMC yeah, crossing to is. get to the high school? Yes. So you can probably do that. That'll get you 250 feet of it. Yeah. yeah. And I think there's a practical sort of limit. It's not saying that they won't do it. I yeah. think it's just more an administrative issue that the, st the discussion on speed, for example, you can't just arbitrarily do some of these things. So question to the chair? Yeah. Uh, so who handles this uh, request? Is it uh, board of selectmen? Is it planning board? Is it the uh, school committee? Is it the building committee? I think it can be the applicant as a condition to the decision if you wanted it to, to, to work that way. Um, to just ensure they close that loop. The condition to apply for it. We can't condition it on whether or not state acts responsibly. Mr. Enough. Chair, do we have to put up? Do we have to put up all the speed signs for that, or if we just put up the the ones we feel appropriate and just ignore those gaps? Why put up a 45 mile an hour speed speed limit sign? Yeah, but we change whatever's in our new zone area, but there's one that's within that 100 foot buffer. It's already zoned. It's already, the speed limit is already 40 miles an hour there. What would be going up is the, during schools, during school hours, the 20 mile an hour school zone to bring the speed down. And as soon as you reach the end of the zone, no, I, I understand the yeah. speed zones are that, but you have to have a sign that says it's 40 no, miles. There won't be a sign. So nobody's going to know, right? Well, if they get to the end school zone. Well, it says end school zone. Yeah. I guess you would remove the end of the zone, right? That wouldn't be in compliance with the mascot standard. Okay. I think you just got to go talk to them. I mean, the common sense will provide. Right. Basically, you're talking about connecting both schools. Yeah. So you remove the two ends that touch each other. Yeah. No, I think you will. They're not that unreasonable. Make it tough. Okay. Play dumb. Play dumb. That was all beta's comments on open items. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're checking off off the beta area. Okay. Um, we're now to the public comment area where members of the public have not spoken and want to. They have that option. Um, yes, ma'am. Um, really quickly, I don't. Do I have to see many? Yes, you do. Okay. Well, 
Music, um, I live on 93 Front Street. Um, I just want to um, say how encouraged and impressed I am from both sides about how, um, how all the T's seem to have been dotted and the, uh, the I's dotted and the T's crossed. Um, I do want to say that I do feel like timing is critical for this project. Um, myself, along with some of the other parents in town, um, really want the school to be opening on schedule. I think it seems like the amount of detail that's come into this, um, I don't know uh, it's not very possible, but um, it, there's still an opportunity to open on time. Um, I'm hoping, especially with Labor Day coming up, that we can wrap this up tonight. I know there are a lot of conditions <laughs> on here, but okay. I think that this hearing really has the potential to be closed tonight. Yeah, schedule, and uh, I really appreciate everybody's work that's coming today. Thank you. <coughs> Any other? Oh, go ahead. So, quick question: Where is the sign for the school? Uh, <coughs> identification as you turn into the site. We have a mon monumental sign. <coughs> so there's no sign on the front gate. No. Definitely. Yeah. You're going to have to, have to know where you're going, I think, to find that one. Did we clean up each one? Yeah. We kind of did. I don't know. That's the only thing I don't have to do, so. Yeah. Okay. We're kind of where we are on normal time. Where are the board members? Would you rather spend some time today or maybe even consider a special meeting in the next week? I think we could talk about our approving the project or our, our ideas about approving the project and reviewing the conditions and wrap this up tonight. Okay. I, 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 I estimate another half an hour to get to where we finally we vote on something. I'm hoping. Because um, um, so of the urgency of the situation, I'm willing to stay in. Yes, fine. I'm just happy we don't have a 10 o'clock stomach, so I'm okay. Yeah. Okay. We continue. We can, Al, we can stay in the building for a little while. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to lock us in. Okay. So we don't have that luxury at Town Hall. Would, would the best thing to do, Mr. Chair, would be to get the uh, conditions up on the screen to we'll, uh, start huh? going through the discussion here. And um, um, question from Mr. Chairman. Thirty minutes. I don't know. Thirty minutes. Can't print them off, right? Well, can't print them off. That's my, my guess. <laughs> Modern technology. Okay. Uh, I'm going to refer to page three of uh, Jennifer's memo. There's extras up here, and then also the conditions are separate up here if you oh. want. It's the same, same as in her memo. It's the same as your, I made some corrections yeah, tonight, right but oh. Why don't, you, why don't you get me a copy of what's up there? So, uh, well, no, those are what you have. Ken. <coughs> oh, the, what I have is okay. Yeah, I, like on my screen, I typed gotcha. it. Okay. Yeah, oh, okay. We're good. If you want to start marking down. A question for uh, Jennifer. Yes. Um, you list uh, three board actions. Are they? Well, let's talk about that right now. The, fir the first one is we will do a series of votes that talk about particular <coughs> conditions in the Dover Amendment. So each one and, is and a separate will, we will, separate we will make a find. I'm proposing that we do a little differently than we normally do, that we do a finding on each of the ones that they are invoking the Dover Amendment on. And then we'll have findings on each of those because they are a little bit different on the, each, each one. And then we will also have to vote that it complies with the remaining site standard conditions with conditions uh, that are allowed with the Dover Amendment. And the last would be a vote to approve this site plan uh, with a bunch of conditions. And that will probably be the harder part tonight because we not only have what Jennifer has put together for us, but we also have done 
a bunch more, and then we have that whole list of ones from the beta that we're going to figure out a way to kind of incorporate them from the beta. Yeah, they're, they're minor in the letter itself, and it speaks for it. So we, talk about it, so no, we, we have standards when we write our conditions. And we write them in a particular way so that everyone can understand it, and so the enforcement officer can then put it, put it together. So, basically, uh, let's talk about the conditions of approval. And we'll start with the with Jennifer's list. And so I already changed number one. Okay. <laughs> Explain number one. So now I have it to say. The applicant shall provide screening along the front of the properties located at 134, 136, and 137 Hayden Row. The abutter shall agree to the screening on their respective properties. At a minimum, the applicant will install 200 linear feet of fencing and 15 trees. All screening will be in place prior to the issuance of an occupancy permit. Okay, so that's number one. Yeah. Did you put six foot trees? I did discussion. not put six foot because that wasn't part of the discussion, but I can add it. I don't know. We had six foot here. Yeah, I was just wondering. I don't know. You mean six foot fence? Six foot no, six fence tall. Six feet, yeah. 200 linear feet of six foot fencing? No, six foot. The, the, the original one says six foot tall trees. Well, right? yeah, no, that don't ignore that first one. That okay. We took okay, never mind. Then. Okay, so you've got a new number one. Yes, and I just read it. I can reread it if no, you'd no. like. Read it one more time, please. <clears throat> The applicant shall provide screening along the front of the properties located at 134, 136, and 137 Hayden Row. I don't think we want all three of them to have screening on. There's yeah. only two of them on there. 137 didn't have. 137, 137 doesn't. doesn't the side. Doesn't. Well, I have I have a suggestion for this um, sure. because there there is another abutting neighbor that. Uh, I, I did talk to them the day of the walkthrough, and they just said, well, as long as we can have a fire pit back here and not be bothered, we're, we're fine. And, um, but I like to leave it open in case they do have any issues after construction starts. And which is, it, which, is this the neighbor at 137? No, this is the, the next one up north. north. <coughs> Who's had the <coughs> up to come to our meetings? So do we need to specify? We don't need to specify the locations, do we? No, no, yes, we do. I, I think we, we want this first condition to talk about 134 and 136. Okay. And 137. And 137. No, they should all be in no. there. I mean, these and are the and 137 will be a separate condition. It'll be something like the applicant will We're allow the... we hairs now, in all due respect. I mean, do you want to get through it tonight, or should we go on? That's we, we want to help you get through tonight, Mr. Chairman. We're working hard to get you through tonight. The second condition would be wait, the so Wait, can we just, so 134 and 136 Hayden Row, and then leave the 200 linear feet and 15 trees in that condition? That's correct, because that's what they agreed to. That was for all three, but that's okay. We'll work through it with the advisors. I thought I asked the question whether it was, it was presented for all three. Which is why this is titled for all, for all three properties. Okay, then, then, then we can add, add to the one. But basically, I was going to say for 137, the applicant will allow the fence nearest 137 Hayden Road Street to remain on town owned property or pay to remove and replace it with a fence on the surveyed property line. And we're screening. Or install. Well, basically, I, I, I want to address the fence because, quite frankly, the town could come and take that down any time at all. And that's fine. Too. That's oh. fine. Too. Okay. The way I heard it was all three properties had some combination of trees and fence, and some of that would vary when there's a walkthrough when exactly. things are coming yeah, along. Right. So the flexi flexibility is in there, and I don't want to. So if the c concern is along the front of, I can just take that phrase out and just say provide screening on the properties located at 134, 136, and 137. Right. That, could, that could work. I think that takes care of it. That could work for. And my concern for the other neighbor is is that they didn't even know there was a project going on back there or going to be, and a lot of people don't. They got. Know. They got a letter, Frank. They got a letter. They got a letter, but. I just want to leave it open for the flexibility. If there is a problem, they could be included. But 
They got a letter. So just screening on the properties located at 134, 136, and 137 Hayden Road. Yes. Okay. The abutter shall agree to the screening on the respective properties. At a minimum, the applicant will install 200 linear feet of fencing and 15 trees. All screening will be in place prior to the issuance of occupancy permit. Acceptable? Acceptable. Okay. Condition two, why don't you keep reading them? Um, dumpsters on the property shall not be emptied before 8 a.m. or after 5 p.m. Okay. Is that okay? The trash truck, huh? When's the trash truck come? To say yes. <laughs> <laughs> you can't empty your dumpsters before 8 or after 5. Is that okay? Oh, before 8 or after 5. Yeah. Is that true with the other schools? Not before 8. It's true before other state plans. Okay. No, but they probably get it out before school opens. Well, school opens at 930, so. That's true. <laughs> Can you live with that? Yeah. The, the applicant shall be responsible for meeting all construction related impacts, including erosion, siltation, and dust control in a timely manner. Okay. The applicant shall regularly remove construction, trash, and debris from the site and in accordance with good construction, good construction practice. No tree stumps, demolition material, trash, or debris shall be burned or buried at the site. Mm -hmm. No parking signs will be installed along the entrance drive and on Hayden Row for 400 feet on each side of the entrance drive. Discussion? Okay. From Jennifer's notes, um, I'm just suggesting we change this to uh, no parking signs will be installed along the entrance drive, period. I, I would, if you want to make it easier, put it no construction signs on the school property along Hayden Road. If anyone starts parking on that road either side, you're going to screw that up terribly. I it's, hard, it's hard to park there. I personally don't think we need the signs. I think it's just overkill. And well, we have them by the high school on both sides. I'm not going to have the shoulder really to park here. I mean, the only way to do it now is you have to jump the curb on one side or mm -hmm. park closer to the wetlands on the other. I mean, you're just reinforcing what's not really achievable anyway. But it's up to you guys. I'm okay. I'm okay either way, but I mean, the idea of the town is to not have overkill signs. What do people think? The, the issue partly is on school open house night. That place will be all completely parked. People up. will park where they can park. Can we leave it that it becomes an issue that we, the town can install the signs? Claire? Can you do pavement painting? What? Pavement painting. What's that? Park along that aisle. Instead of a, a standing sign. This is on the main road, Hayden Road? The concern Row. is on Hayden Road. That's what they're talking about. On Hayden Road. There's no shoulder to paint the road there. Right. And so. Pavement's the drive aisle. No, it's not right out. If you're going to do it on a public roadway, it would be a very important time. Yes. Post it on a telephone pole every whatever space in the telephone pole is on. I'd rather not see the sign. Yeah, I'd ask the selectmen if we could, uh, becomes an issue down the road. Is it something we can address down the road for the town? Absolutely, we can resolve it down the road. Okay. Yeah. We'll take it off Hayden Row, just on the, on the driveway entrance. Thank you. In the event that the amount of snow on the site exceeds the amount that can be accommodated safely in the snow storage areas indicated on the site plan, the excess snow shall be removed from the site. Mm -hmm. Prior to major school events, an order shall be sent out identifying off-site locations for overflow parking, including EMC Park and Hockington High School. Lighting at the intersection of Hayden Row and the site drive shall be off from 11 p.m. to 6 a.m. except in an emergency. This condition shall not apply to lighting necessary for public safety and security and or required by the state building code. Right, so I imagine the police would want that road lit to some level versus you know, the word off. And since That's you right. have that clause in there, I don't know. Public that. safety. I think this is just speaking to the intersection. Is that where you're speaking to? 
I mean, uh, the police is going to want, I imagine, the driveway lit to some level. Right? They're not going to want it total right. dark. So when you pull up to the driveway, it's a dark intersection. But I think it gives you the out with the public safety. Right. I also put a street light on one of those poles. Right. There is an existing cobra head that will be <coughs> located on whatever. So are you okay with that restriction? As written? I'm going to defer to the police. I mean, they're going to invoke the safety or not. So I imagine the light will be on. Is that a yes or a no? <laughs> I mean, that's what we're looking well, for, think, right? I th yes. Well, I think on the site drive, we talked about uh, for the neighbors of trying to not light to the entrance road in all the way up. Right, but then we're in the same breath. We talked about how there was already an existing overhead light at that exact location that would probably stay. And, and that one will say, and then that's the lighting that you get. I mean, it's like a subdivision road that doesn't get any street. It is the lighting on, those, on that. On that roadway up is dimmable to I mean this goes with the, the one behind it you know mm -hmm. nine I mean these two are kind of together but I imagine that the driveway will be lit to the building and I you know I can't vouch for the school whether they're going to agree to shut the lights off entirely at night I don't believe that's going to happen and I don't believe the public safety would be the reason for that yeah the superintendent made a statement at the meeting two weeks ago that uh, they would uh, work as the building becomes operational to adjust the adjustable, dimmable lighting to appropriate levels yeah, based on feedback and, and safety needs. Mr. Chair, can we reword that to be either dimmed or off? Would that work? No. Dimmed is fine. Yeah. That, that can be dialed with all the appropriate parties. What do you guys think? What do people think? I mean, we, this is what we require on every commercial industrial type use. I mean, we're not saying that lights running around the building. The building I'm, I'm okay with the way it is. The way it is. Yeah. Yeah. First thing we have, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're gonna you're gonna have neighbors. Yeah. Well, what what do you do with the entrance to uh, Hopkins, the the Loop Road? You said the lights stay on all night. They stay on all night. The advantage in this case is we have dimmable lights. Dimming. Yeah, I'm okay with eight the way it is. It's just they're, they're dimmable, so I mean, if, if it's too bright for the neighbors. No, but this so is this is requiring that they're off. I'm saying off eight, or dimmable. Oh, okay, but it, uh, this condition shall not apply to light necessary for public safety and security or required by the state building code. Like Jen said, you can yeah, leave. I really have no objection to eight. It's nine. That's really tries to restate and reinforce what gives you relief on eight. You know, nine seems counterproductive to what he was trying to accomplish. Well, I, I think it's different because I think the parking lots are different. You know, the security is the building. No, nobody cares about the parking lot out in the back. You know, it's right, it was so, Ken, what's the difference between eight and nine? What basically, basically, those three or four houses in the back parking lot, you're going to have a parking lot lit all night in the back of the house is is within 150 feet of the parking lot. So should number nine address the parking lot? That's what I think it did. It should. does. Yeah, it's and well, why can't we just say the parking lot? And, or Lighting outside the drive, which means in, in the parking lot. You can say outside the drive and in the parking lots shall be off. So that means just the parking lot that's outside the drive and it's not the building. That's, just that's correct. The building is lit, and you, if you, if you configure it such that the roadway right in front of the, you know, the first row of lights, you're okay. It's just the back of the lights and the, the main body of the parking lot. So this really should be the parking lot, not the... We can do it the parking lot. Just we'll say in the, the parking lot. Parking lots, plural. Lots. Lighting in the parking lot shall be off? Yep. Yeah, and again, I would pop that in with the public safety override, because... They have the ability to trump. Do we do the same with banks and stuff like that? In similar Just like the other schools. You know, we, we didn't use words like that. <coughs> well, again, we have the advantage of the dignity of the dim. Just like the other schools just have less impact. Okay. So, the security needs. Are we agreeing to nine as we written? Um, so I just have it, the second sentence to say, lighting in the parking lots shall be off from 11 p.m. to 6 a.m. Are we adding anything? Are we adding the public safety yeah. phrase? 
think it could similar to eight. You could just add the same line, yeah. right? Mm. This condition shall not apply to loading necessary public blah blah blah. You can add that. All set. Yep. Ten. The applicant shall have a regular maintenance program for porous for the porous pavement, including vacuum sweeping and power washing when necessary. Agreed. The director of municipal inspections inspects site plans under construction for compliance with the approved decision of site plan review. The director of municipal inspections determines at any time before or during construction that a registered professional engineer or other such outside professional is required to assist with inspections of the stormwater management system or any other component of the site plan, the applicant shall be responsible for the cost of those inspections. This seems like a new typical definition of inspections. Um, no, I don't know that we would have something like this. Issue, right? yeah, 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 something like fine. this. And it's kind of like our catch all, though, just seems That's fine. I should know any of the budget for uh, expected. So then we as have. As long as we do everything right. Um, yeah. That's fine. So we have some extras that weren't in the package. Um, so um, if you're looking at the paper in front of you tonight, um, I took off number one because that was addressed with the detail. Correct. Um, and then number two says during school drop off and pickup hours, a school crossing guard enabled to direct traffic shall be located at the school entrance on Hayden Row. During school drop off and pickup hours, a school crossing guard enabled to direct traffic shall be located at the school entrance on Hayden Row. Yep. Okay, and then these are the ones that I furiously typed while everyone was talking. So. Last minute. Wooden guardrails shall be used on the site. Are we conditioning that or? We, condition, we do have it as a metal guardrail to get the detail. Our, we propose a metal guardrail. Is it that galvanized steel or is it that rust, that kind that, of bronze that, and uh, rust? We, um, we have Corten steel, which is that um, naturally rusting uh, brown. It's a W beam. It looks like a standard highway guardrail, but it's brown. Okay, I mean, that's, that's so, fine. That's fine. That I, sounds I, like. I'd be willing to go with the Just go with that terminology, right? Stuff. <laughs> The pedestrian, the, shiny stuff, right? the pedestrian crossing signal located at the driveway entrance shall be on a post-mounted vertical signal with no mast arm. Mm -hmm. okay. um, the applicant shall obtain an order of conditions by the Hawkington Conservation Commission. I didn't know how else to say that. Okay. Um, the applicant shall, met some, shall submit oh. fine. The c concerning the uh, utility pole, and so they plan. just need an order of conditions. But they've submitted a notice of intent with them, so they just need to close that out and get an order. But it covers three different areas. The, the utility pole, the culvert uh, under the driveway, and, and the culvert. Uh, the overall site. Right, but I don't, I don't even I don't know if you need to specify that. No. I, think they just I don't think you have to get to that. Yeah. Well, if any of those don't work with them, Frank, in your experience, they, would they just not approve it? So if they approve it, they're approving all of those. Like they're either going to issue the order or they're not. They've, they've ordered, they've, all the sidewalks and the culvert extensions that we've done for sidewalks, they've all approved every one of them without an heartbeat. Realistically, they will probably, um, I'm, I, I'm just thinking, what if they don't, I don't know. If we're fine with leaving, if, if we're fine with leaving it up to them, what? They approve or not approve. I, I just think these three different areas are significant significant enough that they should be mentioned in the in the condition. Read it back it one more time. Yeah, please. Say that. Well, read, it, read it back. All, all it says is the applicant shall obtain, obtain an order of conditions by the Hawkington Conservation Commission. Like, how does the CONCOM know that we have these concerns? Will they have the beta report? I guess um, we got today. By the, the way, the, the the thought that we would have is one of of of. You can tell me if you can do this or not. That, that there's, a, there's a part of actually sort of getting the detail accepted, which is you know, does it accommodate a sidewalk? Does it have a head well, wall? I thought we well, I thought we were going to address that differently later okay. on. Okay. Then the yeah, uh, and then I think the two work together because if you have that condition which addresses the detail. It's the approval of the detail that the CONCOM would have to address in turn. And, which is what Beta is asking or pointing out to us that needs to be done. That is 
Hong Kong's jurisdiction as far as our time constraint is that our condition is that this gets worked out with these three specific items get worked out with whatever else CONCOM has going on with this, which is these main three things. Does it make which, it, which is the Article 12 Water Overlay Resource District yeah. for the utility pole, the cover plan mentioned in G31, and then the cover plan in yeah. G40. You know, we could do something, Frank, right. with this work, like, say, the order of conditions and Including yeah, that's what I was going to say. Just specify those, including, but not, including not, but but not yeah, limited exactly. to. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. We've all seen that writing before. Okay. Thank you. Um, the applicant shall submit final record plans to the planning board no later than, and I left the date blank because I didn't know, because we don't technically have final record plans. So, and I assume they would want to wait till after ComCom to. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the things that are missing are very minor. It's mostly just the signage. I mean, the right, but we just still need a final record mm -hmm. set. G46 to 57. When, when can you provide 30 days? Just wait till after next week's con meeting. But yeah, a so week like after that. How long after? Yeah, a week after that. So, so, so by 14 days, 20 7th. days? What? 14? September 7th. Okay. Okay. And then, um, and Mary, can you tell me this answers your other concern? The applicant shall work with the Department of Public, Direc Department of Public Works director, director with regard to the construction details of the culvert in Hayden Row at the driveway entrance? Yep. Okay. Sorry? The one at the entrance or the one on Hayden it's Row? It's the one on Hayden Row. I'm sorry. Hayden Row. So be yeah, details the and the scope of it. No, construction meaning. details and scope? Yeah. Of yeah, we so can't just say redo town projects. So we have to work that out. Yeah. Right. So just yeah. in the cover in Hayden Row. I would just say corrugated metal cover. That would just define it. And then um, I forgot to put the hours of operation that we have in our bylaw, so I'll add that. Yep. And then the last one I have is the applicant shall apply to MassDOT to extend the school zone to meet the existing school zone. Yep. That's okay. all I have, unless I and forgot that, something. And then we've got to add in all the signed ones, and we can do that as a... Well, I had assumed they would be on the final record plans, and I could check those off when they submit them to me. Okay. We agreed that all those, as we agreed tonight, will be on the final record plan. That's what I had assumed. Okay. <coughs> can can I just go back to the guardrails just real quickly? Could you say wood or? I took it out because. What's that? I took it out because they had. Uh, okay. Right. Uh, I'm fine with that. The only point I would make, if you guys find that the wood ones are cheaper or same price, and it's not a big deal to do them, just do them. Okay. If, if, it, if it works rusty out. Ones. Yeah, well, they're doing the rusty ones, I think for sure. Well, the, yeah, the rusty ones we found pretty good. Yeah. They, they actually hold up better than what I think. But okay. So, any further discussion on the conditions that this would will be granted under? Okay. Now we're into the site standards and the discussion of site standards. Uh, basically. We go through A through R. And we're going to propose a series of motions instead of just one because we have all these silver amendment ones. So I propose that basically we're finding that it's going to comply. Uh, the only discussion that we had on the letter is, is on the on the poll, which would be different. We're finding it complies. It, uh, the full ones we're all yeah. set with. So, and we also, yeah, we're also defining the exterior lighting of, which is number nine under N, that this is not considered a recreational facility, even though we have playgrounds. So, just with the understanding that, that this is not does not apply to that because it's a it's a school exercise yard as opposed to a playground, I guess. Uh, 
So basically, I would propose that we look at the Dover Amendment ones first. Is there any public comment to, to uh, site plan standards? Okay, seeing none, I think we're ready for the planning board to do some voting. So, the first, first one is to determine a vote that the plan falls under uh, Mass General Law Chapter 40A, Section 3 of the Dover Amendment, and certain site plan standards do not apply. I make a motion. With, 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 and we will detail the ones that don't apply in separate motions. So, okay. Frank, you want to make a motion? Make a motion that uh, this plan falls under the Mass General Law, Chapter 40A, Part 3, the Dover Amendment, and uh, certain site plan standards do not apply, which we will outline. Do I hear a second? Second. Motion seconded. Further discussion? Seeing none, how do you vote? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Anyone abstain? Motion carries. Okay, I entertain a motion that site plan standard H is subject to the provisions of the Dover Amendment. Or no, this. this you don't that, get it. That number one, it does not, uh, this standard does not meet the standards but is subject in, in the following way areas. The maximum height exceeds that of non-residential buildings in uh, zoning section 210-121, and that the parking lot standards for light landscaping in 210-21-14, or 124E, e, um, are not met. But they are not applicable because of the Dover Amendment. So moved. Now, just for the record, note that we received a letter from the zoning enforcement officer. Right. And let's add that to the motion, too. So moved. Second. Further discussion? Seeing none. How do you vote? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Anyone abstain? Motion carries. Going down to section. Standard M, the sidewalks were not, we, we, we find that it does not meet the standards under Section M, because sidewalks were not provided along the entire frontage of the subject property, uh, along existing waves. Uh, however, this is not applicable for Mass General Law Section 40A, Section 3, the Dover Amendment. So moved. Second. Further discussion? Seeing none, how do you vote? Aye. Aye. Then we're going into Q. Q that we f we find, you know, I've entertained a motion, that we find that this plan does not meet the right. standards in section Q, meaning that the mechanical equipment or other utility hardware on the roof is not screened from view of the ground. However, it is not applicable per Mass General Law 40A, section 3, the Dover Amendment. So moved. Second. Any further discussion? How do you vote? Uh, Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Anyone abstain? Motion carries. The last one is we find that Section R, or Requirement R, does meet the requirements for the dumpsters, however, and, and does comply, however, it is not applicable per Mass General Law Section 40A, Section 3 of the Dover Amendment. Now, we could just say it complies because it does comply and not do that, but and 
but we did get a, a, a law that said the, a letter from council, I believe, that it didn't apply. So it's our question. We can just say it complies because it does comply. It, I would just be consistent with the way you word it all the others. There's no reason to word them all that way, but since you did word them all that way, Well, this one, you, this one, this one you did comply. Yeah, yeah, but you might as if, if the way you said it is fine. But all dumpsters are screened. It complies. However, it's not applicable. I mean, the other way you could have done all this is to say, we have no authority over these things and just be silent. I motion the way Ken said Since it. you chose to be explicit on each one, just be consistent. I move Ken's motion. Second. Further discussion? Seeing none, how do you vote? Aye. 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 Okay, then I'm looking for a motion that finds that the sections a, B, C, D, E, F, G, I, J, K, L, M, no, no M, N, O, P, comply with the section, uh, with the standards. So moved. Second. Second. Move and second. Further discussion? Seeing none. How do you vote? Aye. 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 Um, motion passes. Okay, the last one is a vote to approve the site plan with all the conditions that Jennifer read and the applicant agreed to. So <coughs> moved. Second. Further discussion? Seeing none. How do you vote? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Anyone abstain? Motion carries. <laughs> so, motion to close the public hearing. So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. Further discussion? Seeing none. How do you, oh, wait a second. Do we need to keep the public hearing open in order to get the final record plans? Because we have it as a condition? Okay. So. All those in favor of closing the public hearing, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Anyone abstain? Motion carries. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, you as well. You. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Congratulations. We have uh, one further piece of business. Uh, we received some correspondence via email today from a woman on Ash Street. We wanted to know why Ashley didn't make our list of sidewalks. When I finally get back with her, I'm going to basically say that we are proprietary to put a priority on Hayden Row because of the school and West Main Street because of the higher traffic. That's kind of the safety, rationale. Safety issue. She must be talking about just the remainder of that. Yeah. Just to go all the way down? Well, she wanted to go by Blueberry or somewhere. Past Blueberry. Yeah. So, so everyone's, I mean, I think that was our rationale, but I just, you know. It was, those two. Okay. Right. Motion to adjourn. Second. Second. All those in favor of adjourning, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Anyone abstain? Motion carried. Yeah, right. I'm sure Thank we'll be in touch because you'll want a copy.